Welcome to HSD, a place to critically think. This is HSDP episode 17. And with me today, I have Prometheus the Prophet. We'll be talking about many different subjects from religion to politics to the rise and fall of different communities on YouTube and potentially the future of the internet as well as the discourse um, of internet and response style videos and critical videos online. So Prometheus the Prophet, uh, why don't you tell everyone about a little, little bit about yourself? Okay, well, uh, I'm I go by uh, Prometheus now. I kind of shortened it, but uh, well, I am a like a U I'm a YouTuber, but I've kind of been on and off with it. Uh, I mainly am active on Twitter. Uh, I'm mostly a liberal, although I have some libertarian positions. Um, the probably the one area where libertarians definitely do not like me is my po my stance on foreign policy, and I also, I'm also very heterodox when it comes to more cultural issues. So I kind of try to find myself in the middle of the road most of the time. I, I don't know what heterodox means. Part of, part of my ignorance. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you always see both sides of the argument and then you kind of come up with a more nuanced view. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like, playing the middle of the road can be good, so long as you don't end up becoming, like, a Dave Rubin middle of the road fallacy. But, yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. good to, it's good sometimes yeah, he, he's to not take middle of the perspective. Road. Well, I mean, like, I think Dave Rubin is, like, um, I think he's a good example of um, the issues of trying to play the moderate. You can easily become, like, a middle of the road fallacy. Like, you could easily, like, an argument for moderation isn't always inherently a good thing um yeah, and even I mean, if it's not a fallacy it, it can definitely look silly <laughs> you know oh yeah i mean there's i would say more like a more like a joe rogan or bill maher type of uh heterodox that that that's kind of more where i am bill maher eh? yeah i kind of like um i kind of like bill maher um well generally and joe rogan eh, i mean he's 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 okay uh not a huge yeah fan. i mean he, there, there's positions I definitely don't agree with him on, but there's others I do. Uh, me being the uh, the vegan activist, so there's a, you can imagine there's probably a lot of things I take issue with. But uh, yeah, Joe Rogan to some extent, like I appreciate the will, his willingness to talk to different people. Um, yeah. So with that being said, uh, getting into this, is there anything you'd like to start off with asking me? Uh, you being the guest is, uh, or should I continue the questions? Um, no, I, I mean I think I, I'm all good. We we kind of covered a lot in our uh, private discussion. Okay, so I think starting off, we'll start with like the early communities around YouTube. So like 2010, but I'm mainly talking about 2015, as well as the uh, skeptic community, MGTOW, Red Pill, Progressive, Right Wing, Left Wing community. And something I've noticed is um, there was a rise of all the skeptic community, but uh, as well as the anti SRW community, if you want to almost say they were the same thing. There definitely mm -hmm. was, they definitely did divide into right and left again. There was a unity towards um, condemning, I guess you could say, censorship and promoting free speech. And over time, that unity became very polarized because of the polarizing figures within it, as well as the own, um, their own, their own lack of an ability to critic. I think their lack of ability to critically, uh, I think there was some lack of ability to, cr to be critical towards the, the in-group. But um, definitely, what definitely really grew out of it was MGTOW and the Red Pill. Like, it's it's definitely gotten a lot bigger in recent years. But when we were on the internet back in 2015-14, it was just starting to pick up. You know, it was just starting to get noticed. But it was so niche, no one, like, no one knew about it. Now it's a bit more uh, mainstream. So, like, what are your thoughts about the rise and fall of different communities? Well, I mean, you definitely touched on something right there. It was the uh, the rise of the MGTOW and the Red Pill community, but I think what really came before that was the umbrella force known as the alt right, which kind of was the predecessor to uh, the MGTOW and Red Pill community. Uh, basically, when the alt right rose, it kind of really started to challenge the position that the skeptic community had when it, in regards to unfettered free speech. I mean, a lot of people were pro free speech, but you know they just didn't like uh, all of the racial stuff that was coming out. So there was a very big divide, and we all saw like I think it was a uh, like definitely Chris Raygun, some black guy, um, 
And I think Andy Worski was on the skeptic side, but then he kind of moved uh, over to the alt right side for a time. Was and he was he really alt right, or was he just like shilling? I, I think he was. I think he was honestly kind of grifting because he uh, he saw that the money was coming in. I mean, the, shortly after that uh, that happened, there was the rise of the blood sports era. I mean, you know, the, the blood sports were like these like unfettered debates where people can, were just allowed to go as hard as they wanted on their opponent without anybody holding them back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, basically, I mean, Andy Worski, like, ran his own channel, Worski Live, until uh, uh, he brought in uh, J- uh, Jean-Francois Garepi as his uh, co-host, and then... After they had a falling out, a lot of those people left Worski Live to go to Garepe's show. Yeah, basically there was the there was also the the rise of the morning Kumite with uh, Tonka Saw and Failure hates us all. Uh, there the, was what the who? Ethan Ralph and the Ralph Retort. Oh yeah, I think I've heard. Of, and, isn't Ethan Ralph a fat, obese, like white yes. nationalist? He yes, was, he, he was. was. He was I mean, insecure he, too, and he, he like he was dating an Asian girl, right? I believe so. I, I don't know much about Ethan Ralph's personal life other than what I've just seen people meme on him for. I mean, I think he had a, like a he had one girl who had a he had a daughter with, and he was in, he's an ex con. Uh, God, I can't. Man, we're really going back like years since I learned this stuff. Mm, I mean. But definitely one of the leading forces behind that was uh, Mr. Medicker, who used to go by, by the uh, non- moniker uh, the Internet Aristocrat. I mean, do you remember uh, Medicker? Yeah, I do. Um, I remember some of the criticisms I've heard towards Mr. Medicker, some of which was being... Um, one of which being that uh, Mr. Medicker... Um, had a tendency of under-analyzing certain communities and situations, and sometimes would jump to conclusions. Uh, I heard that he did that with furries and a few other groups. Like, he, like he, um, he kind of either cherry-picked or created, like, really bad, faulty generalizations. And uh, I think that was, like, that was one of the strongest criticisms against him. But beyond that, I always kind of found him a funny guy. But I didn't really know his positions, per se. I knew some people who liked him, who said he was against the alt-right, I knew some people who didn't like him, who thought that he buddied up to them too much. But I, I've heard plenty of people claim that he's buddies up to too many people, so I don't, I don't know. Yeah, he, he's kind of kept his politics to himself. I mean, uh, I remember uh, Sargon of Akkad like, kind of uh, saying that he was a liberal, which he kind of took offense to. It was... Uh... I mean, uh, he, Mr. Medicare was definitely a very charismatic individual. I mean, when you when he comes on to the podcast, you can definitely feel the energy that he gives out in the chat. Yeah, he definitely um, he definitely had one hell of a sense of humor and his ability to make uh, jokes and ability to make people laugh. But I, I did want to push you on something. So when, as far as a red pill goes, I don't know how far back it goes. But um, like I've heard, I've heard like a number of people within these communities claim that this community has existed since like the '90s or '80s or something. Um, just in small niches. Mm. So I think like the modern red pill. Like I think I think like there was there's there's been an overlap of men's issues, men's rights issues, and men's rights activists, the red pill, and the alt right. Because to say it very bluntly, there's a portion of the alt right that are just, uh young people that either have had bad experiences with multiculturalism at different different groups of people or they've been victims of racism or hate to say it they just can't get laid and their yeah. solution is go back to white ethno states so if they can get a society that oppresses women but also creates a societal preference for their race um mm-hmm. then they would basically elevate their status in society so i see a like basically i see a portion of issues in society that haven't really been addressed that essentially led to all these different groups festering online oh yeah but, um, I, can, I can definitely agree but i think i, mean, I think oh sorry you go oh go no go ahead 
I think like what you are right on is that there's something about the alt right and the red pill that is very similar, and I see it same thing with men's rights activists. It's just there's a lot of the same issues they talk about. Yeah, I, alt right I, was the umbrella term. It, it it was the umbrella term that got everyone inside. And let's remember the the original the the face of the movement for a time was Milo Yiannopoulos, who was uh, at at that time he was like a gay Jew who liked to have sex with black men so but he was always talking down to the liberals and he was kind of talking up men's rights issues so a lot of those people came in but then it was Richard Spencer who reasserted his authority as the the head and the one of the people that coined the term alt right by establishing it as a white nationalist movement which i think that was that was at the end of 2016 it kind of fractured the alt-right and then we had the uh the red pills and the mras uh, or the red pills mras and the uh migtow community uh come out from that yeah um i don't that's i, I think like the umbrella turn yeah because the thing is is like the the alt-right was always originally a white nationalist label but the thing is is no one really knew what the alt-right was and yeah. the problem is at the same time is when the mainstream media or maybe not mainstream but when both uh i guess you could say media that's in opposition towards conservative perspectives are calling different people alt right who are not alt right who are not white nationalists it added to confusion so you had people uh, way back when, you had people just um, no different than how people to this day, they sometimes call people Nazis who are not Nazis. You had some people who were being accused of being a white Nash, uh, being accused of being alt right uh, for yeah. just disagreeing with them. And it sort of muddied the waters a little bit. It made it harder to, for people to really understand what it even meant. And then you had Milo Yiannopoulos uh, claiming that uh, the alt right is not a bad movement. But I think at the, just at the time, there was a bunch of people that were just really frustrated and uh, they just, they didn't really do any research. They just clung to a hashtag or a meme or an idea. Mm. And yeah, um, it, yeah, I, I think, yeah, but you, you can continue. Oh uh, yeah. Basically what I was going to say is um, yeah, it's pretty much uh, what happened was the, it, it was an online internet movement uh, with 4chan or 8chan uh, as the alt-right, and it was white nationalist as it started. But um, what happened was, I mean, Milo Yiannopoulos kind of associated with the alt-right and kind of became a more prominent figure, at least publicly, about it. And then Hillary Clinton decided to uh, go out and make a whole speech about, how, about the alt-right and how it's bad and all that. And basically because Hillary Clinton was so polarizing, to people on the right, they kind of thought, oh, hey, if Hillary Clinton hates it, the alt-right must be good. And you had, like, suddenly a lot of right-wingers suddenly wanting to ask to join, to how do I become part of the alt-right, or I'm declaring myself alt-right. So it really created that bubbling effect. But what, what sort of started happening at, in the beginning of that was with all of these, like, uh, you had... Uh, young blacks, you had even some gay men uh, going in there claiming they were alt-right, and you had people like uh, Andrew Anglin, who was one of the main leaders of the alt-right. He literally like hated the fact that Milo Yiannopoulos was promoting the alt-right as a recruiting tool for people that they found uh, undesirable. So it really was a culmination of a lot of this opposition to Hillary Clinton and liberalism in general that kind of swelled the movement of the alt-right and for a time pushed the uh, white nationalist part of it to the side until, again, when Richard Spencer made that speech in uh, Washington, D.C. to a bunch of neo-Nazis and they were doing all the Nazi salutes and he was like kind of uh, using all these German terms like Lugenpresse and uh like hail our people hail victory cut moments you know that's uh, when it just really started fracturing you know um on an off topic uh actually no we'll finish what we're saying then i'm gonna say uh, a little jab at richard spencer um 
But it is definitely, like, I do think a lot of them make a lot of these red pills. I think a lot of them never really associate with the alt-right. I think, I think there was always an internal struggle uh, for the mm -hmm. term of what red pill was. For the time, the alt-right claimed that they were red-pilling the liberals. And there were, uh, you know, there was right-wingers claiming to own it. But at the end of the day, there was something really strong about the men's rights and um, the very red pill manosphere uh, part of mm -hmm. YouTube. I think they just tended to address some of the problems that men were facing head on, as well as men's rights activists. I think it's why they're still around. Where at the end of the day, I think like the alt right was just the alt right was just a lot of modern anger, and I think there is just a a growing level of political correctness in modern society that has not been yet challenged. Um, mm -hmm. actually, did you see um, did you see Abraham Preach's video uh where? HVH3 was uh, interviewing a guy and he was constantly calling him insecure. No, I don't think I did. Um, kind of give you like a, this is like a perspective when I was growing up. Like if I challenged a lot of very, uh, very politically correct narratives, like if I said, because like um, if I said like I preferred certain things that were traditionally, uh, if I, there were certain things I preferred that were tr more traditional for women, um, I would be accused of being insecure. Uh, and it took me years to realize this, that some of those things are and are not my preferences, which I can get into if you want to hear them, but I don't think it's important. Right but I, I think what is important is like for a long period from like the nineties, eighties to like the two thousands and then 2010, it was pretty bad. Like there was a lot of gaslighting, uh, that I had experienced just in my very development, uh, from the people in my my social circles, my family, my friends, um, constantly more or less uh, pressuring me to have politically correct narratives. So you had this happening for a very long time. And I think right around the time of 2015, during the immigration crisis in Europe, where there was, a, we'll use the word grape, there was a huge grape epidemic, you know what I mean? Um, and there was a huge crime wave epidemic with, uh, I hate to say it, a lot of the Muslim migrants that were coming in and a yes. lot of them were not refugees. Some of them were just, some of them were just, uh, economic migrants. And it's important to remember that's, that was only a small portion of them committed crimes, not all of them. Yeah. Some but of there them was were even, uh, criminals that but, were for, like released from prisons and they just put them in the groups. Yeah. I think, they put them in the migrant groups. Yeah. And, and more or less, there was a huge scare in Europe around that time because of the overwhelming support, uh, for um, very conservative anti-LGBT, anti-women policies. Like the one poll in, uh, which I'm going to be releasing a video soon, they'll have it, the TV poll in the UK where they actually found uh, that over 51, it was like 51 or 52% of Muslims thought homosexuality should be illegal in the UK. Um, and then like if you, like the Angry Foreigner has done mo many videos about like, uh, rape statistics in Sweden, stories of uh, LGBT hate. It um because Sweden and Germany really got hit hard as well as the UK, uh, the nations with large welfare programs that were attractive towards migrants. Mm. And the sad yeah, but basically um but yeah, like so right around that time there was this there was a a type of environment that created a angry backlash because I think around the same time a lot of the skeptic and atheist community were talking about the negatives of Islam. Some of the beliefs are actually had in held in Islam, the life that uh, the life that the prophet Muhammad lived. And I think it created a type of atmosphere where there were a lot of people who, who were brought up, who had a very, um, a very ignorant and mis and very uh, politically correct perspective on Islam. And when a lot of people mm -hmm. were realizing that there were some negative things in the holy texts and that what they were taught, in school or by society wasn't necessarily true and see what happened in europe um as well as i think feminist frequency really really um i think feminist frequency is probably one of the greatest one of the greatest uh suppliers of nazis in the world because they, they what they did um their ability to uh to uh misrepresent problems in gaming created a an entire generation of men who became a little bit more hostile towards uh, progressive ideals or maybe not even progressive mm -hmm. just s even secular ideals there was a portion of people who just wanted to go back to conservatism there was a portion of people that were 
feeling very frustrated at the time. Um, that's kind of how I remember it a little bit. Is yeah. uh, a lot of people started also doing research about the history of feminism, and they realized that the history of it wasn't quite uh, lovey-dovey as a lot of people per perceived. Uh, there were there you know, there there was, there was terrorism, there was uh, threats of violence, and even more so, there were. Um, I do believe there was a one academic scholar. I can never remember her name. Put a link in the description. Uh, I can't. She she made a video where um she actually essentially went over the history of feminism and that there were multiple feminists who signed who wrote, wrote a declaration comparing themselves as slaves to men around the time of slavery, which uh you know it's. I think that's pretty. I I can understand it to an extent, but to an extent. It was. It also just completely framed women as victims when, at the same time, the, you know, men were also oppressed into their own gender roles. So, like, you had a whole generation of men that were seeing a different perspective, and that felt lied to, and even women, and uh, it just created a negative place. It's it, cr it created a toxic environment for hatred to grow. Uh, but yeah, I'll I'll, I'll shut up. Uh, your thoughts? Oh yeah, no, you you you're making some excellent points there. Yeah. Like there, there's certain uh, like men aren't they're, they're not really like taught on they're not taught as much to be like how to be men. They kind of have to sometimes wing it, and they kind of end up falling short of what people would expect of them. And suddenly, you know, like men end up uh, losing out on on uh, love to other men because they are deemed more masculine and some cases so that it creates like a generation of anger and it's kind of like we're going through that now yeah i mean like i always bring this up the ubc study um during the ubc study um something they found was they were looking at like um which i can actually i can give it to you if you want it right now um something the ubc study found is that basically monogamous societies tend to be more pro quality low rates of sexual and physical violence um aka grape uh, the the news article from the UBC also, uh, which I, I read, and I, I read the abstract, I read the news article. I didn't read the full um, the full study, but basically, more or less, um, monogamous societies tend to be overall better. Uh, when there was greater genetic unity in the family, there would tend to be less uh, in, internal conflicts within the family. So when you have a mother and father that were genetically related, and siblings that were fully genetically related, uh, which makes sense, because like, I, I, I've seen that in my life, where sometimes, unfortunately half siblings they didn't have quite the same bond as full siblings um yeah i've seen that but um it's it's obviously not just like genetic right but it's cultural but, like it's growing up with different yeah, parents. I but, mean, like, you kind but, of i think there is an implicit a more implicit bond that is uh portrayed yeah so i think i think like uh the point which i'm trying to get out here is like i think there was like a large number of issues that had essentially created a, a a type of festering point where any any type of radical ideology could essentially cling to a um could cling to somebody and make them become uh any uh, basically i'm saying there was a there was a portion of lonely desperate men that were angry that were looking towards anything to believe in yeah you know? basically People who are always dealt a bad hand in a society will always try to cling to an extreme movement that tries to overturn matters into their favor. Yeah, um, it's pretty funny. Like, I remember an old alt, like, almost alt, they were almost alt-right. Like, I think they were MGTOW, but, like, they were talking about how, um, this is a long time ago. I'm not even sure if their video is still up. They were talking about how they don't want white women going down to, um to have uh you know what with uh black men and that they don't think mm -hmm. the solution is the alt right like uh i think there's like there there's definitely like some level of inferiority complex between like some i think some like i think there were some guys on the internet that had like this some this level of inf inferiority complex either because they were a minority or because they're white or this or that the third um like, actually, when I did my Charleston White video, I found plenty of anecdotal evidence of self-reports claiming that uh, there's higher rates of discrimination towards African-Americans for dating. In fact, the Pew Research Center did a, uh, it was authority claim. I didn't look into the, like, the, the actual details of the statistics. 
but they claimed that 9% of people in their study said that they, I can't remember, was it 2018? Or whatever, um, the most recent one, basically, 9% of people would not date a black person. They would, they would not be fine with their family member or friend dating a black person, or I think it was family member. Um, and it was like only 4% of people said they would not want someone dating a white person. And then the, I think it was mm. like Asian and Hispanic were like mixed. I can't remember. It was like six or seven. I can't remember, but like, or five. But uh, just anecdotal evidence from self-reports, like black people do seem to get dealt a tough hand. At the same time, like I could easily imagine, like, I don't know, some white kid who's uh, feels lonely could easily have this idea in his mind that all the girls are going for uh, what they call, you know, Tyrone, you know, some uh, muscular black. Guy. Yeah, mostly <laughs> yeah. from... Uh... They're all going out for a con. That's mostly a trope from internet. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I can say this because, uh, like, internet pornography. Yeah, once you go black, you never go back. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I can't, I can't, I can't count how many. Like, I, there were so many white guys like I talked to way back when in the day who actually believed that. And I come from Canada. And I don't think anyone. Mm. I've never met a single white person in Canada who believed that. <laughs> like, oh. I, I don't know. It's like it's. It's it's kind of weird. I, I I sometimes feel like um just from like the outside looking in because I'm not from America. I kind of feel like there's a portion of Americans yeah. that uh they haven't really they 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 kind of yeah. view they kind of like I I think Gen Z has changed it, but I think like for millennials and older like there's a portion of people that view different races as almost like completely different groups. Yeah, it, it's it's uh it's definitely more of an American thing. I mean, you know, we we've had uh. Like I don't I don't know like what the can the the can Canadian uh, like counterculture scene was back in the '90s for you guys, but uh, like here we were always talking about like it was always the hip hop community and they would like uh, always infer you know not black superiority but uh, kind of like once you go black you don't go back sort of thing. Yeah, I mean like. Um when it comes down to it like um when it comes to any man just trying to come across as confident masculine and even to some extent um e egotistical like being a little bit egotistical can be attractive like you see this like when i'm not online like online i present myself a little bit differently but in the real world i might have a little bit more of an attitude um <laughs> you know what i mean um and i think people take that a little bit too literally you know um you know, when a, when, a, when a black guy has this moment with a white girl, there isn't some sort of chemical that goes on her brain and she's like, oh my God, I can never go. <laughs> like, there, there's not some, like, hidden code in her brain. It's so, it's so stupid. Um, It's just competition of genealogy. And all you have to do is, like, win the competition of genealogy. Yeah, or, and... or at the very least, it's like, a, it's there's a cultural... Uh... There's like a, a cultural stereotype there where uh, like black men are seen as more tough because they grow up in a harder life. So therefore they, you know, they're able to take what society throws at them with more ease. But like the thing is, I grew up in I grew up in like 2000. I grew up in like the 90s. So like my culture I grew up with was like I hung around rednecks. There was rap. There was rock. There was uh, like we'd play hockey. And then, like, halfway through playing hockey, we would just end up fighting each other physically. Like, my friend would, like, fuck, would goddamn smack me in the face with a hockey stick. I'd go over there, and we would start rumbling. Like, we, we would start, like, pounding each other's faces. <laughs> like, that was essentially, like, you know, if, if, if like, sh shit hits a fan, like, you, you just start punching the other guy out. Like, that was, like, my 90s culture, my, what I remember. Uh, probably giving lots of other kids concussions because I won most of my fights. Oh yeah. Oh god. Oh, um, we've all been there. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if like that sports was like that way back for you in the day. Not, I mean, not always with hockey. I mean, we had we had basketball and football. Did you guys get into fist fights back then? Mm, sometimes, not as much. Okay, yeah. I, I guess we're going off topic here, but I think like my point is is like I think. I've noticed that people in the United States, uh, they definitely seem to have this, like, very almost, um, they tend to have this, like, more tribal perspective of preferences. 
that uh in Canada was just it wasn't as strong. Like uh nobody I've never met a single person who actually genuinely believed once you go black you never go back. Maybe that's because they just kept it to themselves. Yeah. But like I think or, like uh, every like, uh, every the, uh... hold on. I think every white person I ever talked to when I mentioned that they all just knew that's a myth. Like no, none none of them was dumb enough like none of them were dumb enough to believe it like and it was only until I got on the internet I talked to some people from America. I was like, wow, some people actually believe this. Obviously, not all Americans, right? But well, yeah, like I mean, it's probably more of an American thing. Yeah, because because we're such we're like probably we're more defined as a cultural melting pot. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. Like Gen Z, the people I've talked to from Gen Z, like particularly a lot of the vegans, but even like just the Gen Zs, they seem completely different, though. Like from my experience, they, they they seem to like have made like leaps ahead, um, when it comes to social progress. Just from my experience, talking to people on the internet, uh, you know, messaging people. But um, with that being said, like I think the point at which I'm getting at here is like there was an overlap between like MGTOW and the Red Pill and the alt right with some of the problems they were talking about. And I think at the end of the day, like talking to men either about just how to how to improve their dating lives or even just how to um or even just talking about men's rights issues was far more productive than trying to become a fascist like i think just i think the 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 idea of becoming a fascist was just a place sorry it was just a it was kind of a fad a cultural fad that started to die out um yeah they kind of wanted to make them feel belong like they belong somewhere yeah and i think the thing is too is like a lot of fascists from what i've talked to most of them what they've told me ex fascists is that most of them end up growing out of it. And, um, yeah, I think uh, I would like to talk about Rage After Storm for a bit, but is there anything else you want to talk about with the, the different communities? Well, and... I mean, yeah, there, there was kind of like, I wanted to more get in more with like the, uh, like the MGTOW and the red and red pill differences. Like, okay. you know, with, with red, with red pill, it's much more about an anger towards like towards women and towards their situation. Whereas with MGTOW, I mean, there's like uh, guys like Better Bachelor, Entrepreneurs in Cars. Oh God! Um, I mean, at least for most of the for most of the videos that I've seen, or at least the videos that I focus on, it's more about like they're talking about self improvement. I mean, I try to avoid the videos where they're just going in on other people, but you know, I do think that uh, a certain element of MGTOW is would be healthy if you know you kind of. If you're having trouble like pursuing relationships, then it it is kind of something with you, and you kind of need to take some time off and sort of get some time to know yourself, to respect yourself, so that once you come back into the game, you're actually much better prepared. Yeah, I think what was it? Um, I think like what was it? Uh, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because like I think it was very interesting that we grew up, we we kind of we kind of were around the time of the skeptic community, but. A lot, a lot of the 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 um a lot of the unity against um against censorship kind of died off, and like uh sorry the unity the only good thing about the anti SJW skeptic community is that there was unity against censorship and pro free speech, uh at least mm -hmm. for the most part, um not all of them, but I think what was kind of sad um where was it I think I think when it comes to like the red pill I think I I might be able to better like describe it like I I I'm to some extent part of that community. And I'm very critical of it. I I uh, I want to say I, I pretty much hate most of those people out there. Um, but I think like the red pill, like so. There's two ways you can look at it. You can look at it from like the philosophical stance from like um, from a lot of people in the community where they subscribe to a bunch of different beliefs, or you could view it as like um, a spectrum between black being a genetic determinism based off physical looks to. Um, to, I guess you could say, expect to, I guess what some people might consider to be blue, expectations purely based off personality and um, and uh, people equally loving each other. And I think there's like a spectrum between that uh, of, the va of valuing things such as your ability to facilitate romantic relationships, personality, status, all these things. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that's one perspective. And then there's the other perspective of a lot of people who consider themselves to be red pilled and i think a lot of them particularly i'm i, I don't even want to call out their names because i don't want to promote them because i fucking hate these people um well actually no i guess i could say fresh and fit because i've already criticized them 
like fresh and fit. Oh, yeah. uh, there's a portion of them, like there's a portion of pickup artists who don't even call themselves that anymore, red pilled, or they didn't even necessarily ever call themselves that, but they pretty much subscribe to a lot of the same beliefs, just not a lot of the stupidity uh, that a lot of the other people believe in. Um, like, uh, for example, playing with fire uh, is a good example of a pickup artist who doesn't subscribe. Like, I, li I like his debates. I uh, watched some of the debates he's had, like when he's hosted Destiny. Um, I watched Destiny. Um, oh, yeah. But I think, like, when it comes to the subject of, like, um, the red pill, like, the manosphere, um, there's, like, a huge spectrum. And MGTOW is on this. And I think MGTOW exists somewhere within the manosphere where a lot of them have different perspectives on the philosophical aspect of dating dynamics. Uh, me, myself, I hate to say this, but I probably would say I'm. Even though I don't subscribe to any of the women hating shit, I'd probably say I'm more of a dark red from all the studies and statistics I've seen, which I could even get into it if, or you could hear, we could talk about it another time. But when it comes down yeah. to it, sexuality is very diverse. So even though yeah. I'd say looks matters, probably with a, like from just the data I've seen, I, th I think it's undeniable. Uh, there are some people who are pansexual, demisexual, where personality matters just so much more. There's a portion of people oh, yeah. where their sexuality and like this, I think that's my my issue I have with these people, is like sexuality is so diverse from morality to art to music. Like Jeffrey Miller, I, I always bring up Jeffrey Miller in mind, but like um, I'm getting off topic here. But yeah, I, I think I think I've described like my perspective on it. Like sexuality is so incredibly diverse, and it's very yeah, relative to environment. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, my perspective is I'm, I'm more of an advocate for like what they what. I would probably coin the term as positive masculinity. I mean, if that isn't already a coined term, uh, like I said, I do believe that uh, men should be like more working on themselves, making them uh, making sure that they're secure with themselves before they would ever pursue a relationship. Because if you're only getting into a relationship because you're miserable being alone, then you're just going to be in disaster after disaster. So if you want to be, happier you got to be happier as yourself than what entering into a relationship to just to validate yourself and like I, i'm i'm they're like because like for like andrew tate the big the big head honcho uh that of the current manosphere uh orbit you know there's him and sneeko you know andrew tate can say something some insightful stuff on occasion but then he just says other stupid stuff that just really wrecks the message yeah I'm, so i would definitely say to promote uh like to promote positive masculinity we should leave women alone to like do to act however they want to act we should not be telling them complaining about them to change their ways when it's really men we need to change our ways to make sure that we are accepting it like of the circumstances like what i'm reminded of is how uh like ancient sparta for example you know at, at one point when they're te the spartans are teenagers during the agogi uh they're made to do exercises while the women are encouraged to point and laugh at them now they do it because you know they want to motivate the men to be better so if a woman is like say more promiscuous much more selective in the type of man she chooses well then you kind of have to be that's cut that should be presented more as a challenge not as a complete uh reason to hate them i mean do you, do you understand where i come from yeah it's um yeah it's competition of genealogy um there's mm -hmm. usually more com competition on men to try and drive a species forward for selection for uh females oh. of any of any species um like uh, Brett Weinstein has talked about this of female choosiness, um, like even in trees, uh, like the uh, the 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 trees, uh, sorry, plants actually put male 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 uh, male pollen through a test, to make sure yeah. it's ideal for mating, and it's no different than uh, pregnating somebody. Uh, it's it's, yeah. a, it's a physical biological test to see if your your genetic material was was physically capable and worthy of being passed on. But um yeah no 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 it's it, it's it's a yeah no I see what you're saying um but I think like which is funny because like I've actually I've, I I'm gonna make I think part four of the capability of the Tate brothers which will be coming out God knows when um because I have so many things in the works 
um, which I've already done an hour's worth of work on that video. Like, I'm actually going to be criticizing his ideas. And I think, like, a big problem, like, because since we brought the Manosphere, I think we may as well finish it, and we can go back to Rage After Storm. But I, I think the issue I have with... Would you like to do that, or would you like to talk about Rage After Storm? Oh, no, let's go. Let's continue this. Okay, so, like, so an issue I have with Andrew Tate is, like, um, and this is a big issue I have with the Manosphere, is, like, this overarching uh, community tends to also prop up a religion, and there sort of is a pipeline back to religion and i can kind of see it mm -hmm. like there's a portion of men um like i think i have yogi obes the, the one video where he essentially defended uh marital grape uh up on my channel yeah that was pretty messed up um oh. yeah um but basically there's a portion of like yogi obes became a pickup artist MGTOW, then he became uh what was it uh like god pill like really christian conservative i remember rachel mm -hmm. oates did some response videos and they were yeah they I, were I they rachel were terror oates. like they, they, her response videos to migtow and red pill they were everything that should not have been said to to, to deconvert these people um, i know like she she literally just kind of went into that community put a bunch of gasoline and like lit the match and walked off and just thought oh you know i did a good job but like i remember yeah, something I, she I said i remember that chaos yeah she said i think something she said about yogi obes look at him he's just average looking um that, that, i think like even the comment section like i actually had a little discussion yeah. with her she said she said some of the long lines of like she could understand that he if he had that perspective like she would understand that he would be attracted to women if he was attractive saying that but if he was average that's just unattractive like it, it's like <laughs> Man, Rachel, it's back in the. But anyways, I I'm I'm dig I yeah. digress. Um, I think like a big part of Yogi Obe's journey was um a big part of his journey was, and I think the large part of the people in the Manosphere is like it's the marketing of masculinity to them. There's a marketing behind it, and it's a marketing scam and a marketing uh it's a, it's it's a marketing scam and it's a marketing uh, lie and it's it's a uh, it's quite often very damaging to these people their emotional well-being psychological well-being and also it's it's also damaging sometimes to their dating prospects because there's so much fallacious reasoning within the red pill within what is useful to extrapolate from it that it's 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 it's, so, it's kind of garbage in a lot of ways for um but like I'm gonna I'm gonna expand on that like if you have this idea that you're supposed to be something because this is what a man is if you're getting a computer science degree and you start falling behind in it because you're going to the gym that's not useful advice like what is useful for one person to make themselves attractive uh, sexual ornamentation peacocking is going to be different for another man someone who's a musician doesn't need to go to the gym seven days a week he needs to practice his goddamn music somebody who's a content creator like us that's a different story someone who is uh works out somebody who's like a professional gymnast needs to work out differently than a professional runner um so if somebody starts dropping what they're doing to try and pursue uh the goal of to be a to be an alpha male like um social dominance or cultural or, or evolutionary dominant dom sorry cultural cultural or evolutionary preferable traits um if somebody pursues those things they can end up wasting their entire life and they can end up wasting their meaning of their life and they could they, and quite often, like with the amount of uh, with the amount of mistrust and even hatred towards women, it's, it's it's really fucked up. But what a lot of these people end up going towards, so like some of these people end up leaving the community, and sometimes that's for the best. But sometimes they end up going towards religion after having meaningless uh, meaningless relationships with women, and then feeling as if the religion and conservative culture is the only way back to uh, to to being happy. Which is really funny because like the only chart I was able to find after trying to look at virginity statistics, which I'll probably throw up on the screen here on the actual video, was from the family studies, which or something the family, I can't remember. It's a very crappy Christian conservative think tank. Okay, well they're not crappy. They're, you know what I mean? It's a Christian conservative scientific think tank. Yeah. It's not crap, but it's not reliable. Um so yeah, what's up, Paradigm? Uh, so the problem is with this think tank is that the think tank actually, um, what they found was looking at uh, marital satisfaction. They found virgins were like basically anywhere between like five to like 15, 10% more likely to be satisfied with their relationship. 
I think it was like a less than 20 or 30 difference with like relationship and marriage, but there was a difference. And that's not even including people who are saying that because they're indoctrinated. Like they're not controlling for these different X factors. Like if they controlled for all these different X factors, you'd have a different, uh, you might have a different, um, you might have a, di a different, um, you might have a different, um, you might have a different statistical happiness, but more or less, basically when you looked at people that were, um, people that were, uh, more likely to have multiple partners, both for both women and men, there was still a large portion of them that were satisfied with their marriage. But I think just because there was a, a, a bit of a decrease, a noticeable decrease, like a 10, 15%, I think a lot of people started to come to this idea that they need to go back to, uh, super, con you know, uh, a conservative Christian culture. And uh, my stance on this is, uh, I think for some people, waiting till marriage is a good thing. For some people, it's not. Uh, and for some people, just having meaningless hookups might not affect their ability to have a relationship. For some, for a lot of people, it will. I had to take a yes from everything I've seen. But uh, like, I can also understand the statistics of the likelihood of being cheated on if you are dating someone who's more promiscuous, less promiscuous. Um, but more or less, like, I can understand like all the statistical arguments. But I think like a large portion of the manosphere is basically um, it's kind of a pipeline back to religion. Uh, and I hope I maybe gave you an idea and understanding of how these people think. Yeah, I mean, like what I can probably say about the uh, the, the statistics of like virgins being happier is uh, they don't have anything to compare it to. I mean, if they're virgins before they got married, then they really have no no understanding of a prior rela sexual relationship before marriage. Whereas the people who uh, have had sex prior to marriage, they they have something to compare it to. Yeah. But actually, I think it was marital satisfaction. Uh, I, I, I don't... I can actually look back up these... One sec. Um, yeah, I, I can look it up. I can look it up in a... Actually, no, I don't, I don't want to... I'll put it up on the screen. Oh, I can, it was I can, marital I can, satisfaction, not yeah, to I think, like. I think it was marital sexual satisfaction. No, I think it was, it was satisfaction with their marriage. No, it wasn't. Oh, okay. And and if not, it'll be on the screen in text that I was wrong. Uh, no, it it was marital. Uh, I've looked at it multiple times, and unfortunately, it was the only chart I could find after like weeks of researching it. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of a dork. Like I'll I'll spend like if I have like a question or like I want to learn something, I'll spend weeks. Like very soon, I'll be making another video with paradigm, another really heavy research video um but yeah no I, th I think like what's cool like when i sort of escaped um do you want to le learn a little bit about me prometheus no go right ahead yeah when i when i basically got out of the skeptic community i realized that, that and i think this is something that needs to be said too i think a lot of the community online has been involving like the discourse like with ask yourself with avi with certain people on the internet the level of research has basically from my opinion from 2010 to now has gone up so the 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 competition for uh the competition for um providing truth and facts has really increased over time like uh back when I, in like 2010 there was very few critical thinkers that used philo like philosophical concepts when doing response videos way back in the day it was kind of just leafy or a bunch of idiots responding to certain ideas but i think the underlying i think there was something underneath it all that people were craving like even that one girl who became really conservative, Sophie, um, I think a lot of people were craving more philosophical meaning within the content of their consumption. And I think over time that started to be provided by different content creators on the internet. And I think these content creators, like, you know, Vegan Gains, Avi, uh, Ask Yourself, I think a lot of them did a good job at um, providing that. But even outside the vegan community, I think there were other atheists who have done a good job of that, like Logic. Uh, or at least I hope he's continuing to to do a good job. Oh yeah, I mean uh, I, I I'm in uh, I'm in some uh, Discord groups with Logic, so I, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I uh, really enjoyed his videos back in the day. He made uh, he definitely made some good mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and I think what I always respect about him is he did research and he he did critically think about what he was talking about. Um, yeah, you remember rationality rules? Yeah, rationality rules is a great example. Mm -hmm. and then there was, uh... I, I recently i recently put up a video uh being critic uh critiquing his vegan take um i'm sorry you go prometheus oh no i'm good you can continue no no i'm 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 the you're the one getting interviewed and i'm talking too much as always 
Okay. Well, I mean, I, I was, I also remember like genetically modified skeptic. I mean, he was also one of them. I mean, I, and I think the person that really brought, like got me, uh, more involved in the, uh, atheist community was, uh, you know, nightmare fuel or Reese. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Reese was a, a bit of an inspirational figure to me way back when. Cause I yeah. think, um, he, he was definitely an idol to Mike. Yeah. So, uh, do you mind if we like maybe, um, I think let's wrap up the manosphere and then we can talk about Reese and maybe Rage After Storm. Okay, go right ahead. So I guess like Prometheus, um, I think like when it comes to religion, we see a lot of people going back to religion. What would you tell okay. the people that have had a bunch of meaningless hookups? Like, what would you say to them if you could? What would you say to them that, you know, try and convince them that religion isn't the answer to their problems? Hmm. I mean, well, first of all, I would try to get to the the psychological root of why they think uh, these meaningless hookups have created uh, such negative emotions. Like, find out whether uh, whether it's just because they didn't understand how to feel love appropriately. Like, maybe they were uh, abused as children and they just can't uh, form meaningful attachments to anyone. Or, um, or maybe it's... Uh, so they've had a, a negative experience when it comes to a, a relationship and they just can't seem to uh, escape it. Or it could even be uh, the opposite. They could have had a really great positive experience in a relationship, but it ended and now they can't seem to uh, like make up for it. And because I think a part of them is still in love with the, the first girl or guy. Ooh, you're calling them out. <laughs> you're calling, you're calling them out for having baggage. Um, yeah, I think if I could, what was it, um, what would you, what did you tell people who, let's say, they were in relationships, uh, I mean, people that were in the, uh, the RP community, whether this be, uh, what would you tell other people that think that religion is the answer towards a lot of the, uh, the men's rights issues and issues of, um, I guess you could say just issues that a lot of men might face, like, what would you say to them, uh, towards these people like you know i mean it's difficult i mean not without without knowing their actual uh what what their actual malfunction is when it comes to like why they can't have a meaningful relationship you know they're gonna chase whatever they want i mean religion is basically a drug i mean when you actually look at the studies um religion ha people with a religious mind have a similar mindset to drug addicts Jeez. Because in a way, religion does feed a sort of need. It, it feeds a need like a drug. But it, it, if you're not like sure with yourself, you're just always going to be craving something. So the main thing that I would probably say is just try to focus on yourself, build your own security up. And, you know, the best thing to do is to love yourself. I mean, if you don't love yourself, then you're never going to be happy. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I think, like, I made a video about, um, the, like, I'm, I made a few atheist videos go talking about religion, um, so there was a one video where I was talking with, uh, someone, uh, with the Babylon Project, and I think eventually I got around to just calling him out one time when I was drunk, and I, I, mm. I just essentially, I just said, you know, the, the real reason why you're religious is you, 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 you want to get yourself you want to get yourself a virgin girlfriend you want to get yourself a girl that's not going to be like uh you know um it's not going to be a you know it's not going to give you much attitude and I, I think i think i called him out and he kind of admitted to it like i remember something that my mom said one time to me like she was afraid one of our family members was going to go back to a certain religion just to date someone or marry someone mm -hmm. um like it's always existed you know <laughs> I, yeah. I just i, I called him out uh but like you know jokes jokes aside right i think a lot of these people mm -hmm. at the end of the day they're not they a lot of modern like I, in my opinion a lot of people go back to religion whether it be lauren southern whoever i think a lot of them are doing it be, because they think it solves some sort of sociological issue so uh mind if i maybe like give my perspective on it real quick oh go yeah, right ahead yeah to the audience anyone that's listening like if you think religion is going to solve your problem what would I say? I would probably just bring up the fact that multiple wars have happened from religion. Um, the vast amount of children being born, uh, 
basically the the natalism that's being promoted by religion isn't inherently rational so it doesn't always inherently benefit a nation even though in the first world nations our populations are shrinking uh we're, we're technically much more wealthy than a nation that's breeding so quickly that we don't have enough resources to help them and i think something else i try to get to really quick is like um when it comes down to the manosphere and a lot of the statistics they bring up they don't actually really look they just look at the negatives like the the majority of people that were promiscuous were still satisfied with their marriage like and this mm -hmm. is coming from like a, a christian conservative think tank that has a religious bias like it, it was over 50 percent like it so it was only a minority of people that were more satisfied and part of that could have just been because they were agreeable because they're religious um and if i could say anything else to everyone is like if you've been having meaningless hookups i'd probably just argue that a lot of what you've been taught to be masculine is marketing and i think like a large part of the internet is selling men to try and be uh internet f you know f boys um uh like the fresh and fit i think like if you act like an f boy you're going to attract f girls if you act like if you act like the type of person you want to attract you're going to attract that person um and if you're going out there meeting people making volume um which comes down to like if you really value it and if i could maybe say something to someone and ask them how much do you value what you want and what are you willing to give up to get it and um if i could say something about religion is we can acknowledge every issue that has happened throughout history and every issue scientifically and statistically without going towards a myth to solving the problem and that can have a larger consequence on a greater scale. We can look at wars in the Middle East to the modern day. But I guess like that was my little speech to the audience. So. I don't know. Okay, um, so, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I apologize. But uh, what would you say if they try to come back at you with uh, the the Stalin era, the uh, the forced atheism in uh, the Soviet Union? Oh, uh, what I would say is like we, you don't have, once again, we can look at statistics, we can look at studies. Uh, I'm a sentient. Um, we can value human beings for being humans. We can value people for being sentient. Uh, we can value, we can value beings based off their sentience. We don't necessarily have to conform towards any one particular ideology. What I would say is like, if you try to conflate atheism with uh, Stalinism, like religion is not a package deal so like um there's an informal fallacy known as like the package deal which is quite often used with politics where one position is conflated with a large number of other positions um it's not a package deal atheism you can be an atheist you can be a conservative you can be an ancap you can be a communist you can be many different things but you don't necessarily have to conform to any one past ideal it's kind of like if Hitler was a vegan, hypothetically, which he wasn't, um, he was a veg. I think he was. He may have been a vegetarian, and that he, that may have been a lie as well. Uh, it may have been a marketing scheme. But mm. um, even if he was a vegan, that doesn't necessarily mean veganism was wrong. If Stalin was promoting yeah. atheism, it doesn't necessarily mean atheism was wrong. Um, like someone else's, someone could be wrong about one thing and right about another thing. Um. So yeah. Like, uh, you know, it's, uh, you can't, you can't, uh, yeah, you can't criticize, you, you can't, you can't criticize an entire belief system based off an association alone. Mm. Yeah, like, I, because I, I remember, like, when Christopher Hitchens, when, when Christopher Hitchens was asked that question, like, how he compares, like, to, uh, like, from religion to the forced atheism of, uh, Stalinism or even Leninism, he would always remind uh, the the audience that the the Russian society was basically primed for a religious mentality because the previous uh, czars were considered the head of the church. They were considered the closest beings to God at that time, and that kind of instills a religious uh, f religious doctrine of follow the leader. So when uh, Lenin and Stalin sort of came into power, that mentality was already there for them to exploit. So it, that is really more where it comes from. I, that, that's really good to know. Um, yeah, I'm not a huge, I, I, I'm not too educated on the so history of the Soviet Union. 
But I think like moving forward, I wouldn't mind talking a bit about Rage After Storm. Okay. As well as Reese, uh, if you'd be. But I, I think, if, is there anything else I want to say about the Manosphere? Mind if I just take a look? Oh, no. Let's go, let's go to uh, Rage After Storm. Yeah, okay. Um, I think, like, honestly, so way back when, there she used to be an SJW, she, self-identified. She used to be very politically correct. Then she became let more politically incorrect. And over time, she eventually became alt-right, a.k.a. kind of a neo-Nazi. Um, but I think she came out as a, being a neo-Nazi at, like, 18, 19. And I have, at the time, I was really angry, but... Like, weeks later, days later, I felt overwhelming sympathy that a famous 18-year-old or 19-year-old uh, was angry and conformed to a stupid idea that was popular. And, uh, like, she had a bunch of friends, and they all just dis dis disassociated from her rather than try to reach out to her. And, or maybe they did try to reach out to her, but... I kind of wish a lot of these people that condemned her way back in the day kind of um I kind of wish that they were a little bit more understanding of her like she grew up being German and being uh facing racial discrimination because she was German so she was a perfect target market who's felt marginalized for a racist to exploit and racist ideologies um but yeah Prometheus why don't you give me your perspective yeah I mean I don't I don't know much about the rage after storm before that uh that video she released that kind of caused the backlash to her but i mean hearing that she was in like a, an sjw type and then just sort of went more into the alt-right territory yeah that's uh, that's something but um yeah basically she just started like talking like more explicitly about race views and that kind of started creating a very big kerfuffle within uh the skeptic community because they really didn't want the free speech movement to go towards like a complete reversal of like every method of progress since the 1960s. So a lot of them just felt like they needed to lash out to, so they prevent themselves from being associated with any views that would uh, talk about going back to say 1956. Yeah. But I think, I think that's the problem though. They didn't have to have that perspective. Like, a good example of this would be Daryl Davis. What did he, you know, his entire career... Have you ever heard of Daryl Davis? I feel like I should. I feel like that name is Ooh, familiar. it's ringing a bell. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, he basically deconverted over 100 KKK members just by talking and being friendly with oh, them. Oh, him, like, yes. Like, I feel I feel like these people in the... I felt like the, the skeptic community, I felt like they were really defensive over the whole situation and angry, and I think that was an immature response um yeah that and i probably would have done the same thing if i was them but i would have immediately felt guilty i probably would have apologized in a weird way i probably would have apologized to rage not because of that i should not have condemned or criticized her but if i was in some black guy's shoes if i was in uh what's his name um jeff holiday shoes what i probably would have said is something along the lines of like hey um you are young and you you, you did a really bad mistake and you had a really bad you know, um, maybe that's not the right way I would have said it, but like I would have more or less tried to reach out to her. So like, hey, you know, you're young. I know that you've been received some marginalized, some discrimination that made you feel marginalized. Uh, why don't we talk about it? Um, because the thing is, is like, um, I, I kind of feel like that community, when they sort of distance her, themselves from her, they just kind of pushed her more towards the uh, the alt right, and at the same time. Like, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of Faraday, Faraday Speaks. Like, he talked about when he became more alt-right, people started disting themselves from him. And yeah. uh, these communities, they prey upon your, your, your identity, they prey upon your race, they prey upon everything that they can from you to get an emotional reaction for you to adopt a racist ideology. And I probably mm -hmm. would have just looked at Rage After Storm as not a neo-Nazi, but as a human being with a bad idea. Mm. like i think yeah that's I, I would definitely agree with that yeah i think that's why i felt disappointed with all these people i just i stopped watching them just because i lost respect for them because if they're not going to say that to her if they're just going to be angry I, I i don't really see why i should listen to these people like a lot of these quote-unquote you know sjw's or politically correct people a lot of them are racist towards white people sexists a lot of them had 
ideals and beliefs that were very similar to Nazis. A lot of them were racist. A lot of them were sexist. Some of them would sometimes even believe in segregation. Sure, they were they had like good intentions at heart, but a lot of their beliefs were relatively similar. Um, you know, like that. What was it? The the Satan song. I am a feminist. I am an Islamist. Like, there were there was a lot of similarities. Um, you remember that song, right? Is that the uh, is that that's the Marilyn Manson song? No, no, it was a song by Satan. It was, it was animated. It's like I oh, am okay. a feminist and I yeah, am an Islamist. Um, yeah, I, that sounds familiar. That yeah. sounds familiar, but I just I can't place it. No, I, I guess what like I guess I think you get my point. Like I kind of wish they reached out to Rage, not as a neo Nazi, but as a human being. And I kind of, I think my my evolution towards veganism has also sort of shifted my views on intolerable views. Uh, mm. And I think I've developed more sympathy and empathy towards, like people have done terrible things. Like I, when I was a child, I was sexually assaulted, and I, I even to a sexual predator, I think I could sit down with them and talk with them. And try to convince them that they're wrong. Sorry like, to hear that. Pardon me? Oh yeah, no worries. Sorry, sorry to hear that. Yeah, I, I don't think I would come to him with a place of anger and hate. I think I would try to reach out to that person as a human. And I think that takes a certain level of character to say that. That my mm -hmm. anger and rage is not worth... Uh, it's not worth pushing away someone that I could reach out to to try and change. And I think that's mm -hmm. why I felt disillusioned by all the content creators. Hmm. I don't know, I want to hear your takes on that. Yeah, I mean, like like I kind of said, I probably was, at the time, I was probably more friendly towards the skeptic community because, you know, I, I was definitely more against the alt-right, probably, probably than most at the time. But over the course of, like, the... Uh, a couple of years, I've sort of moved more, more towards a heterodox view. You know, just looking at like certain issues when it when it comes to like the data points. Like, there's like the thing with uh, Pew Research, for example, that uh, you know most atheists they, they tend to be they tend to be white, and more white uh, majority nations tend to be aligned with have or have more atheists in them than say non-white countries so there is i could probably say that there is some correlation on that but um the thing is i i would never like take that as the main takeaway the causation yes oh the white has the atheist gene like... yeah i think it's just more you know like white societies i mean they happen to be a little more developed yeah um they're like they're they're de more developed for first world nations and they have more access to information so they're more likely to be skeptical towards uh religion that really doesn't require much uh introspection it's just literally they say you follow yeah um yeah pretty much um do you have any other thoughts on Rage After Storm, like your feelings, your react, the reactions to it? Do you have any other yeah. thoughts or feelings? Yeah, like I said, I mean, I, when I, I first started paying attention to the whole skeptic, like the skeptic community divide after that video, I didn't really know much about Rage After Storm before then. I mean, she was just like some, uh, some person that came on my radar as that was going down. Mm-hmm. Was it, um, yeah, so sorry, I couldn't be a little more helpful or more insightful uh, okay. on this, but that's just, uh, I'm just kid telling you the truth. So, I think, I think for me, Reese, like, I think, uh, actually, do, do you want to talk about like how he's inspiration to you or me? Or, yeah, I mean, he, he's just he's basically a lot more, uh, a lot more hostile to like religion. He takes, he kind of does more of preaching to the choir when it comes to his content. I mean, him, him, and, uh, of course, uh, there, there's another guy. I I still like him to some degree, but he's uh, kind of he goes off on a couple of different tangents that I probably don't want to follow him. And that's Devin Tracy or atheism is unstoppable. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a lot of people have distanced themselves from him because he's gotten more in the he's gone more in the direction of the alt right, even though he's pro Hillary Clinton. 
uh, oh, do you mean that he's a race realist, or, or at least I hear that he's a race realist. I I think yeah De- I think Devin Tracy is a re- uh, a race realist. I can't I haven't heard him yeah. say whether he is or isn't. It's just when it comes to his content, he seems to lean in that direction. Yeah. from my perspective. Yeah, like last I've seen from him, yeah, and it's it's really sad too because like I know some people who are race realists who are not racist, like they're not equivalent. And it's one of these things where I feel like people people get a little bit too emotional. Like, mm-hmm. just because somebody believes COVID's caused by 5G, I don't think that means they hate Chinese people. Like, I don't think mm-hmm. Dave Devin's a racist, number one. Uh, number two, I, I think I kind of want to space myself from Devin just because, like, uh, his history with... Um, uh, I guess you might some people might interpret as criminal or illegal, potentially like either illegal or playing the fine line with legal and illegal behavior with doxing. Uh, like I kind of yeah. I feel like Devin was the type of person where his anger got the better of him, and he was in an environment with people who just kind of reconfirmed his decisions and who defended him. And I think Devin was basically in the spotlight. I think he he just reached a tipping point. Like, he, he broke bad. Because um, mm-hmm. somebody, yeah, somebody called the police on his family. And it took me a long time to think about this. But, like, I think if the, if the average person was put in his shoes, I think a lot of people would have done the same thing that he has done. Not to say what he did was mm-hmm. right. I just, I'm saying, like, oh, I'm not this holier-than-how character. You know, I'm not free from being able to do terrible things, right? Um... So when I look at his yeah, character, I mean, when I look at his character, I just think to myself, like, uh, I appreciate the fact that he is a, I appreciate that he's a humanist, and not a racist. I appreciate that he's an honest person. And I, these are virtues I respect from him. Uh, but I, I do. But yeah, it's just. I, 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 I never really wanted to associate with that type of stuff, you know. Um, and once again, this is like, I'm not preaching hate towards him or anything, but yeah. Yeah, ne- neither am I. I mean, de- like I said, Devin will still make good content. I mean, uh, some of my videos, like where I uh, I, I use my avatar's uh, silhouette over uh, like a backdrop, that I kind of like took some inspiration from him and Reese over that. I mean, yeah. when I when I started doing that, I think for me, uh, mind, if I, mind if I talk about how Reese inspired me, or do you want to keep going? Oh, go 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 right ahead. I think Reese, like, he was someone who was really intellectually honest, and hearing someone speak who was honest and fair, it, um, at the time, I had a lot of fallacious reasoning, I had a lot, like, I would either appeal to authority, or I, I was inconsistent with my reasoning, I was hanging out with people who were inconsistent as well. Um, I was easily manipulated by media, and just watching him talk, I felt like I was called out on my shit at times because his ability to be fair and honest and to just kind of calmly look something over, it made me feel like I had to up my game intellectually if I wanted to be able to fairly analyze things and come to the truth. So listening to him talk made me realize there was something severely wrong with who I was as a person. And yeah, that was... And yeah, like you said, like how he goes hard on religion. Um, but I think what was even more important than how he went hard on religion was the fact that he he spoke his convictions. And even if there was positive aspects to religion that there may have been historically, he focused that there was overwhelming negatives. And I think this mm-hmm. is also something I want to talk about, like with the manosphere and Andrew Tate, something I forgot to say, is just because religion might have something positive to offer you in the modern day, we just look at religion from a whole from if we just look at religion from either the middle east or wherever in the world even if we just include war there was still so much violence towards lgbt people there was violence towards people based off something they really there's evidence to show they had limited choice in it for both nurture and nature their correlation higher testosterone in the womb um you know like i said brains like trans people having the opposite brain of the opposite sex or brain function or structure um and yeah there there are there are nurture correlations but 
Um, oh yeah, but, and there there was a there was an atheist that I uh, in the atheist community that uh, he he was he was much more prominent than I was at the time. I don't know pretty much of what he's doing right now. I mean, his name was Godless Cranium. And he actually came up with a great challenge. He basically said, name something that you could accomplish through religion that you cannot accomplish through secular means. I mean, that I, I think was a great way to sort of put religion in its place that, you know, religion is nothing special if uh, secular means can accomplish the same outcome. Exactly. And yeah, and definitely like... Uh, you know, and Reese, you know, one of the things that he really he was really good at is he really like knew how to sort of box you in. Like, yeah, his speech, that you were that his, you were sort of, you know, if you were a little wishy washy on a, on an on an issue, he he would push you to get right in get to get into that box, you know, where you have to take a more harder stance. Like I remember his you know, I was I was a little more like I was probably a little more tolerant of religion when back in the day, but then, you know, watching his videos, it just made me like more in my conviction in saying like no to it. Yeah. I think, I think for a lot of atheists, Reese kind of helped revitalize some conviction. I remember his speech he gave to Malfi Buddha. That was, that was one of the most heartfelt speeches I've yes, ever heard in my life. I remember that. Yeah. That was a very heartfelt speech. Mm -hmm. And, I think it's easy to like look at religion for what it can give you. Like if you imagine, let's say converting to Islam, marrying a Muslim mm -hmm. girl. Okay. Sure. There are some statistical benefits for using an individual, but I think like, I think this is the problem I have with the manosphere as a whole. It's the normative framework of egoism. Are you familiar with it? Are, are you familiar with normative ethics? Hmm. <laughs> No, uh, not no. not as not as much. Maybe maybe I am. I, I just okay. don't I don't recognize so, the concept. Normative ethics would be like a so basically there's practical ethics how we apply them. Normative is like how people should behave, and then meta would be like our definitions of good and evil. So like normative ethical framework of egoism would usually inquire like it usually like there's different types of egoism, but generally what they usually have in common is what is good is good for the individual. So acting out in your own self interest is good. And the problem I have with this is if it's good for you to, quote unquote, go to religion or use an individual, marry a virgin. Is it still a good thing if, let's say, that religion that you are promoting literally promotes um, homophobic, like it literally promotes discrimination towards LGBT, LGBT people? Is it OK if that religion uh, tries gay conversion therapy, which is recognized? I think, what was it, by the international, was it something like the international torture? So, no, um international awareness of torture society or something like that it's recognized as torture like there's overwhelming mm -hmm. evidence to prove that it, it is torture and it doesn't work like is it is it morally okay for you to do something because it benefits you and if it's morally okay for you to promote religion because it causes harm to others then what is the difference between let's say grape or sexual assault or physical assault because it benefits you as an individual so it's 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 kind of like these moral lines of trying to trying to create a moral concept purely based around what benefits you as an individual and i think yeah. like i see this a lot with like uh quite often brain dead manosphere people as well as brain dead feminists uh people that are advocates of their own sex or gender they tend to just they tend to act like egoists when you when you they when you hear what they their, their their moral claims their moral claims are usually defined off of what is within interest of their own in group or self and I, I i wish to challenge egoism and i've even i've even created like an intuition pump for some of my vegan arguments with egoism the apathy pill but i could just easily re, re i could just as easily retailer it towards someone who's promoting religion uh basically the apathy pill do you, you want to hear like the concept of it like it's, it's actually it's a concept to try and um emotionally rile up somebody hmm. you interested well i mean basically from what i like Probably the best quote that I've ever, one of the few great quotes I've ever heard about it. I mean, this is a partial quote, but it's uh, it's a good one nonetheless. Um, it's basically if you ever want to convince someone to do something moral, something morally depraved, but believe it's morally good, that takes religion. Or dogma. 
but yeah. Are you, are well, you gonna... it's kind of the same thing. Not always, and I think that's important to remember, like Stalin. But um, Prometheus, uh, I'm actually curious. Would you like to? Uh, would you like to hear the uh, apathy pill? Because it's a useful tool when making argumentation. Okay, go right ahead. Well, no, are you interested? I'm curious. Do you want to move up forward? Well, sure. Let yeah, let's go go for it. All right. So essentially, I basically ask someone like if you if I could take you give you this pill and it induces nightmares and it makes you somewhere on the sociopathic psychopathic spectrum. So you have very little to almost no empathy. Then I run them through a series of questions like if they would kill someone, would they uh, like and and when I ask them if they'd kill someone like their neighbor, then I'd say okay, well you kill them, but you know you'll never get caught, but someone you know will find out who respects you. Would you still do it? And I basically tell them that you have all the same belief systems, all the same values, up until the point you took the pill. So it's basically, your mind is freed emotionally from your emotional intuitions. What decisions would you make? And then the end of all the questioning of different hypotheticals, different situations I could put someone in to do terrible things, I ask them, how would you feel the end if all your emotions came back? And it's, 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 it's an emotional tool to challenge egoism, but it also helps you find out how consistent someone is. And I, I, if, when someone just says they don't care, that's something I run on them, is the apathy pill. Yeah, I, I feel like that, yeah, that comes from, uh, th there's a similar story in that from uh, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. Oh, who's that, Dostoevsky? Yeah, Dostoevsky, uh, he wrote the book Crime and Punishment, where uh, I think a guy uh, tries to convince himself that he can... Uh, to kill someone he can make as many rational arguments as possible but then when he actually does the crime and he's never caught um he feels the overwhelming guilt so it, it's not the exact same but it's kind of like it touches upon that issue yeah i think but i think what's i think what i try to get out with the apathy pill is like um like i've convinced some people to change their ethical positions uh let's get said i wasn't going to talk about veganism but i've gotten some people to change their ethical positions on the subject uh, at hand, and I think it's a useful tool when someone says they just don't care. Because uh, sometimes the answer to them caring is deep down within them, and you just have to pull at it a little bit. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, something that we said uh, kind of brought up that memory, but um, yeah, Reese to me was inspirational in the sense that he just, he really spoke his convictions, and unlike a lot of people in the skeptic community, he was just honest and kind of fair with his critical analysis of like issues and topics. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's like, to yeah, he, he, was, he was truly, uh, he truly stuck to his convictions. I think that is kind of what made me definitely gravitate towards him. Cause a lot of these people, they kind of followed, they kind of grifted away from talking about it. Like, uh, I mean, I can't think of anyone off the top of my mind, but you know, you could probably think of some, but people that used to talk about one topic, but then they grift to another. Like I think, like you a know, lot of the, but... yeah, I think a lot of the old skeptic community, whether this be like Andy Wolski or whoever, like it, yeah. it's it's questionable. Like if they were grifters, like a lot of these people, like I don't think some black guy was a grifter, but maybe he was. I don't know. But like all these people oh. in this genre, uh, they seem to have more of a similarity of what they were against than what they were for. Yeah, I think it's just and, they they were just it's more catering to the market. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, kind of, but like. I think a big part of it too is like um, what I'm trying to say here is like it's good to have like bipartisan uh, community to some extent, but to some extent you also need to have some grounds that you, some level of principles that you also stand on. Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of a hard, I guess, a bit, a bit of a hard balancing act. But um, I guess like when it comes down to it, um, we talked about Reese. Is there anything else you want to say about him? Anything else? Mm, no, he's. Well, we pretty much covered him. Uh, I mean, but basically, I'm just gonna say. I mean, I really like the guy. He is an inspiration. He always will be to why I'm present on social media and why I try to get YouTube videos out. Yeah. Um. Uh, mind if I talk? What was it? Um. Mind if I talk a little bit about like um, religion as a philosophy? So, like, we kind of okay. like. I think. I think. Like, we could just quickly touch on like religion as a sociological mechanism and as a philosophy i think maybe quickly as a sociological mechanism because we've already talked about it to some extent mm -hmm. religion to me is both a means of integration assimilation uh controlling of the dating market as well as 
ideological beliefs and um and potentially even political political um political beliefs as well or economic so religion tends to help it's, it's basically almost like a story to try and unite a nation in some ways or form now you could say divides and conquer but technically is division always bad we're divided against people who are non-humanists or racists that's good but the problem is within religion is is the division um is the division justified for the progression of a society and i think it's something that's not and i think that's like what i take issue with and i often talk about uh, i've talked about the babylon project that it would be useful if we started funding uh community centers to actually replace some of the services that churches have done throughout history to actually have like actual free community meetups within community centers um like, I think there should be more programs to actually help replace these services. And, uh, yeah, um, as well as taxing these, uh, ta taxing these religious communities as well. Uh, but Prometheus, mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on a religion well, as a sociological mechanism? Then we'll go into it as a philosophy. Oh, yeah. Basically, what I, I would agree with everything you said, although I would probably expand that to, uh, it's basically, it's basically used for complete societal control. It is meant to manipulate society into believing that, you know, they're, they're, it's with a carrot and stick style uh, mechanism, that if you if you believe in this, you will have good outcomes, you will be happier. But if you don't believe in it or you are negative towards it, you will end up in uh, what they call hell. So you're, you're kind of given like a, you're like a damned if you do... You're damned if you do, damned if you don't, kind of <laughs> outcome, and that's basically how they use it for societal control. I mean, you know, hell, that sounds great. You know, like I could go down there, yeah, you know, meet, meet a bunch of hookers, maybe some of my ex girlfriends. Oh yeah, no, they'll, <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll tell you. Okay, well, you know what? If you if you follow this faith, you will be you you will be happy. You will get to see your family again. You will have the land of milk and honey. But uh, if you don't you will be going to hell to you where you will suffer torture and anguish but uh this this god loves you so and he needs your money for 9.99 you can save your soul today for 9.99 oh, yeah. they get they get, the, they get the little uh the, the collection plate and you're putting you're putting your money in there thinking uh, hey it's going towards a good cause but guess what it's probably going to uh your preacher's airplane yeah. And, you know, and, and it's it's weird how people can easily fall for this stuff, you know, because if they've had to move the goalposts so many times over the course of millennia for, like, say, oh, well, uh, when evolution that was first uh, finally, like, presented in uh, Charles, uh, Charles, Charles Darwin's Darwin. uh, Origin of Species book in 1850, I think it was 1855, and well, that that kind of kept the ball rolling, and suddenly they've had to kept moving the goalpost because then they moved it to uh, intellectual design, and you know some of them are even willing to admit that evolution is real, but they'll still believe in God for some reason. I mean, it, it's it, it's really not making as much sense anymore, and yeah. I think that's why you're starting to see some people like leave. You're you're seeing a, a complete exodus of people from religion even even nowadays and i think part of it is just they can't explain the theology of the past anymore others are it's kind of like it's gotten just as politically divided as regular society and they kind of use church as an escape but now it's no longer an escape yeah so when you mean church is an escape like what do you mean by that you know, this people wanna they wanna go to get get away from the world and just listen to someone talk, and listen to little music and feel make them make them feel good. Get that little drug rush, like a, a, making a callback to an earlier point I made. You know how religion is basically like a drug, so they need to get that kind of escape from their current problems. But you know, once it's done, they enter their problems again and looks like they need another morality car wash uh the following sunday yeah i've talked about like my uh when i had psychosis when i was younger um actually i had psychosis for a little bit um apparently never fully developed but um 
when I had psychosis, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so basically a psychotic break. You're, you're basically like cuckoo. Um, I actually believed I was talking to like demons and whatnot. Uh, and like looking back at it, I realize now like the pro- because like you're talking about God and religion. Like when you have a like humans by nature, we we crave status. When you have a deity that has status, it's inevitable that there's going to be some person who wants to get closer to that status. Inevitably leading to somebody trying to have communication. So when you have someone trying to communicate to some sort of deity that doesn't exist, when they believe it's real, there is the possibility of them essentially um, hearing their own voices and believing it's the voice of God. Or per, or mm-hmm. perhaps maybe even, um, on one hand, like religion has the capacity to help try and shelter a broken mind, but at the same time it also has this ability to um, help fuel people delusions and people's yeah. uh, psychosis or um, other types of psychological disorders that might associate themselves with believing that they've been touched by Jesus or God, they've talked to Jesus or God, or they've seen Jesus, like, there's, it's it's just, it's very concerning, because, like, if an entire society didn't believe in any of these concepts, no one would give someone the benefit of the doubt, but when you have a society of a bunch of people that are very skeptical of these concepts, whether they are they, they have some level of religiosity or not, um, they'll be deemed as like uh, they'll de- be deemed as like crazy or having some sort of psychological disorder. Like a lot of these a lot of these prophets are just individuals that probably had some level of psychosis and or other hallucination disorders. Yes, yeah, so like more like a, a narcissistic type of uh, schizophrenia. Now, and, and that and you you touch on a great point though, and like. You know, can you imagine like going through these psychological uh, problems when before there's any clinical term or diagnosis possible? And religion just keeps telling, and religion kind of helps fuel it. Yeah, and, and basically, yeah, religion just kind of preys on this. You know, there, there's some people that even decide to start their own religion based on these like schizophrenic uh, delusions. Now, I mean, to I don't mean to to touch on what you you said earlier about your condition. I mean, were you ever uh, psychologically diagnosed, or was that just? Uh, did yeah, you just... I did go to a psychologist. Oh, wow. Yes, I did go to a psychologist. He asked me multiple questions. And he said to me that he doesn't think I have psychosis, but what I said, he thinks I have had it in the past. And it was kind of okay. funny because the entire time he was just like. You know, we can help you. It's it's manageable. But at the end of it, what he told me is, uh, yeah, I'd be thankful you don't have psychosis. I'm not sure if I could help you. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes it occurs in uh, it it occurs in extreme bipolar cases or even uh, some mild schizophrenia. Now, I mean, that's not. What, I'm not saying that's what you have or no. anything. Well, I'm I don't. Not a psych- psychologist, I don't, but I, don't, I was just asking that question because I, I was have curious. Any, yeah, I don't have it anymore. What he said to me was. Um, be grateful you pulled yourself out, even if it wasn't fully developed. Pulling yourself out of psychosis yeah. is actually very difficult. And even with, like, the absolute best help possible, uh, what he said is, like, um, you know, I, like, not even fully developed, what he says, like, there's around, a, like, just his professional opinion, he said it's, like, a 50-50 chance. Uh, maybe, like, a 40-30, I don't know, but I was, like, or, uh, I don't know, 60-70, I don't remember, but, yeah. So it was, um... Definitely was it was what it it is what it is. Um, hey Prometheus, you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I, I, yeah, sorry. And you don't you don't have to dwell on it if you don't want to. No, it was no, just no, a, no, no. It was um, just a curiosity. Would you be willing to talk to some of the audience at the end of the at the end? No. Um. Some people in here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I can. I can. I can definitely uh, stick around. All right. So at the end of this, if Paradigm and if Zodiac, you want to talk, you can have a little chat with them. Also, we got we got uh, Zodiac raising his hand here. Yeah, we got yeah Prometheus is uh, he's an OG, a legend, a legend from back in the day. Um, so Prometheus, um, I guess I'd like to ask you like um, for as far as like religion goes, like how do you see it as a philosophy? Because we have two more things to go through: religion, and politics. So religion is a philosophy. What is your opinions? Do you want to hear my opinion on it? Like, what are your thoughts on religion? Oh, as a philosophy? Yeah, go right ahead. What's what's your opinion on it? Oh, I just run reductio because I'm too late. Like I'm, I'm, I'm talking about veganism, I'm talking about manosphere stuff. Like I'm debunking, I'm debunking Andrew Tate. I'm exposing him for like the, 
the, the, the, the, the, the really weird stuff that he's done in his life and the beliefs he and probably he still Islam? holds. Uh, no, actually, he admitted to trying to groom a minor on stream shamelessly. Um, no yeah. joke. That was part one. Part two was the crime data. And then part three was all the evidence of abuse and sexual, like, and all this is like evidence before his most recent accusation. And then part four is going to be his ideas and why he's not worth listening to. Um, but yeah, like, uh, so I just run Reductio. So like, what I basically just say is, hey, um, why do you believe in God? They say, oh, well, it's because like, uh, it helped improve society. Well, I'd say, okay, well, what if literally it was shown that for like prehistoric time, like, you know, ancient civilization, abuse towards women uh, helped improve society. Like, should we normalize that too? If they say, okay, yeah, then, well, okay, what about sexual assault? Like, we wouldn't be here today if brought us here today. You know, is that good? Um, and if they say, well, you know, if they maybe say, well, sexual assault's a bit extreme, or if they don't like that, I could still switch to something else. I could say war helped develop our society. Um, and I run reductios on these beliefs. Um, so yeah, that's generally my method is like breaking down argument, premise, and conclusion. So wait, do you, you know what an argument is philosophically? So like statement, premise, conclusion, right? Well, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm familiar with it, but uh, why don't you you fill me in? Uh, oh well. I didn't mean to sound rude. Um, I'm I'm sorry. I'm not sure if that came. Oh no, you're that. fine. Okay. Um. No. Okay. So yeah. So basically, like the statement. So like your statement, your uh, reasons for your statement. So it could be like, um, God is real. Premise one. I heard from God. Premise two. Um. Premise two. My family told me. My family told me God's real. Conclusion. God's real. So, you know, uh, your family told you that's completely traditional. Like, your family could tell you. If you family told you god isn't real then i mean that god isn't real if you heard god uh can you prove that was god uh, so so the, so the problem is, is like the burden of proof was never met so like mm -hmm. I, I run people through that to try and debunk the argument because I, I i i don't read enough about religion so like my perspective on religion philosophically is that it's flawed filled with holes filled with homophobia and that is a sociological mechanism with lots of metaphorical truths that are important to analyze. I think one of which is being monogamy. Uh, that's been good for society. But with that being said, I think what is ideal is to talk about every positive aspect about religion. Um, analyze it, break it down, and then remove deities, gods, and religion from the picture. Like, I think uh, we can take all the good parts of it without actually having to utilize religion in and of itself. Um, and I do see the advantage of manipulation of, uh, th th there could be a certain level of advantage towards manipulating a society. I do see that. But overall, if, if someone was to make the argument that, let's say, if I manipulated my partner into believing there was a God so they wouldn't cheat on me, or I manipulated my family that there's a God so they wouldn't steal or commit crimes, I could run the reductio's other way. Like, couldn't I also manipulate my family to do other things that I prefer? Does that inherently make it moral? Mm -hmm. uh, like, basically, then I try to challenge them in other senses. Couldn't I convince them of other ethical things to believe in, other than manipulation? Couldn't I challenge people as individuals? And it's something to this day that is easy to say, but it's... Even I, my, I myself find it difficult to fall through with criticizing the people I know. And I mm. think criticizing people honestly and fairly uh, i think this dialogue and trying to understand every positive aspect i think it will help replace the ideology the sociology i think it'll leave all the dogma in the past but the philosophy itself is flawed it's 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 honest it's it's, it's philosophical comedy to me it's uh it's a uh, it's, it's 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 absolute joke like you like I, I made a video like if there were gods or gods like if we basically brought a bunch of like if there's a god, there could be like uh, so many reasons as to why they created us. They could have created us literally to create soldiers. Like this could be a simulation to see how well we function for war. Uh, and then the next life is not heaven. It would literally be a battlefield. Um, like Valhalla. Yes. Uh, yeah. It could be. It could be a fuck. It could be a goddamn nightmare. Like we don't know why something would have created us in the first place. So the inevitable question, like the the questions that come up in play, is is so infinite and vast. 
uh, it might the, the possibilities of reason could even expand which our, our our own feeble minds could possibly think of every like we might not be able to even think of every possibility um but when it comes to philosophy i see the philosophy as something i ideally want to replace in every aspect sociologically philosophically and basically uh yeah I, I just find it overall i i find it to be temptation towards honestly i i i just find it to be predatory it's it's just it's tempting towards people that want certain things whether it's tradition, traditional lifestyle marriage it's just designed to take in uh take in take in uh desire and to um to try and adopt multiple beliefs on top of that pre-existing desire um but honestly my my, my, main, my main issue is like theism and religion per, per se mm -hmm. like i'm like when it comes to certain things like buddhism um depending on what subsect i might have different opinions but i don't necessarily care as much about atheist religions in per perspective it's more so my problems of, with theism and the effects it can have on the human mind uh psychosis um um the divine command theory people believing it's moral to kill their own family non-believers lgbt people in the name of god uh the, mm -hmm. the 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 raw potential for philosophical genocide just fine killing animals based off god uh not off any actual substance of argument like i could technically go backyard and like go into my backyard and literally torture my dog and say that my god told me to do it therefore it's good it doesn't make much sense to me mm -hmm. philosophical exactly. Uh, I'm sorry for the long ramble. I, I honestly, it's an oh, interview, yeah. and I'm, I'm a terrible interviewer. You're fine. I talk too much. I can't shut up. You're fine. It's good, it's good to hear this stuff. But, I mean, anyway, yeah, I think um, in my perception, religion is basically a glorified ideology that is reliant on uh, pre, presuppositional, pre-science uh, talking points and tries to use a, like a, a good, good analogy word you used was predatory uh, viewpoint of like make getting a commitment out of people pretending like you know if if you do good with us you go to a happy place when you die but if you are bad towards us or you don't join us you go to a very bad place when you uh when you die and they use the fact that nobody can tell you really tell you with a definitive uh clarity what happens when you die because once you, di you die you're gone I mean, of course, you, you you can probably pull up some stories of people that died, like, for eight minutes, came back, and then now they're going to tell you about a religious story. You know, I mean, it could have easily just been, uh, like, your mind telling you, like, what you wanted to see, like, kind of like how a dream works. Yeah. Um, I think another thing, too, is, like, I, I to me, it's more than predatory to work. Like, I see religion as far more predatory than just heaven and hell. It preys upon people who want a traditional lifestyle. It preys upon people who want to get married. Like, it preys upon people who want commitment. It preys upon people who want anything that it has to offer. It preys upon the LGBT community and their sense of uh, marginalization. And wanting to feel, um, potentially maybe even wanting to be heterosexual. It preys upon any desire that it has to offer. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is it's, it's literally... It's it's basically a philosophical predatory. Um, it's just a, it's basically a philosophical predator. Um, yeah, it, it, it preys on the abnormal on uh, certain abnormalities of nature. Um, yeah, but and more or less the way how I see religion is it it may have evolved. We may have evolved to prefer a cultish a cultish type of uh, societal structure, or religion might function as a parasite, uh, hijacking the tribe um but either way we look at religion um i just see it as predatory all around like it's literally designed Great. to try and tell you that it has something to offer you you should come to us because you will have you'll be able to talk to other people that are married you'll have uh you'll go to heaven uh you know if you want to get married this is a great place to be there's lots of people to meet you know um you should come to join religion so you don't go to hell and burn like a heathen. You should come to God and uh, go to gay conversion therapy so you won't be a sinner. Do you feel insecure about being LGBT? Well, we can fix that. 
with 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 absolutely no proven scientific evidence we are going to traumatize the fuck out of you and torture you um yeah no i like i'm, I'm being comedic here but like i think you kind of get the, the comedic point like it's basically it's their goal is to basically try to sell you what it needs to reproduce so the religion the ideology is like parasite it it's basically telling you whatever it needs to in order to try and get you to join it and it's basically the psychology of cultism yeah well yeah it's it's um i mean the psychology of cultism basically is it explains practically everything of why religion has become so successful I mean, religions are cults. This is one of the definitions of a religion. Yes. Or one of the definitions of cult, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, cult is just more the, the more... I mean, I don't know if I would call it more broad or call it more specific. Well, it is... I where think... it, it literally is... I mean, it's. I think it's broad in the fact that it can, it can encompass more than just religion. But it's specific because it that's it, the exact situation that's going on you are being brought into a cult and religion is just a cute little word for it i'm actually curious what is your opinion towards like an atheist dating a religious person i think as i've gotten older i don't care as much but yeah I, I i don't care i mean actually, me i probably if, if she was like devout and wanted me to pursue uh, a path towards religion in order to have a relationship, I would definitely be against it. But if a woman is, uh, you know, she's religious, but, you know, she doesn't force it on me, or she she absolutely respects my point of view of things, then I'm willing to, to say okay. I mean, For me, the, uh... the kind of the point of... Uh, even though I, I do try to convince people to walk away from religion, it's not... If I try to use any me measure of force, then it makes me kind of what I despise when it comes to religion. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Um, I think that's like... There's like... So there's there's two aspects to it. One of which you brought up, which I almost forgot about, like I did, uh, is that if you try to like force people to agree with your views, um, and if that's something you dislike about religion particularly um what was it the, the um yeah trying to yeah if it's something you disliked about certain uh, certain religions or ideologies is forcing people to conform to certain things if they want to be in your mm -hmm. life and be one of your loved ones no different than how some people are kicked out of their family because they're not because they're lgbt because they don't conform yeah. to the religion they're like are you that much better but at the same time there's also the criticism that could be said that uh you might preach about being atheism but at the end of the day like uh i guess you say a religious person could make the argument that perhaps maybe a more traditional or conservative belief system may have uh at the end of the day that might be something that either you prefer and or created someone that was preferable mm -hmm. for a long-term relationship which can be true in some ways uh because like religion does help um it does help prep people to think long term about relationships, uh, but it, it's something that I've definitely thought about with Sam Harris and hearing people criticize because I think Sam Harris married or dated someone who was religious. So I don't know. It's 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 interesting to bring up, and I I just kind of want to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, yeah, I, I understand. But I, th I think it's difficult to try and get people to see the what you said, which was beautiful. Like, we don't want to force our view on people in, like, when it comes to our friends and our lovers, right? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, there's proselytization, which is what, uh, like, most of these religions do. But then I, I don't have much problem with uh, Jewish people because, you know, they're, they don't proselytize. They keep to themselves. And there's, like, non-theistic religions. I mean, you know, those are kind of lower on my scale as well. Buddhism, like you mentioned earlier, yeah, I'd probably consider that pretty low because it's uh, mostly the the religionist talks about working on them on yourself. I mean, yeah, sure, it comes up with the idea that Buddha uh, trained the gods or taught the gods uh, spirituality and stuff. But you know, again, it's it's lower on my uh, it's lower on my shit list. 
was pretty funny when the Dalai Lama said, like, uh, what was it? Oh, it's terrible yes. and funny some of the stuff he said, like, if I if I had yes. a female reincarnation, she'd have to be pretty. <laughs> oh, <God>. hmm. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to talk about the Dalai Lama with, with the current controversy with the kid. Wait, what the fuck? I didn't hear about that. Uh, there was this. There was this where the Dalai Lama like uh, told the kid, like right in front of the cameras, to to stick out your bite my tongue or st stick out your tongue so I can bite it or something. I can't exactly. I can't remember exactly what he said, but it kind of caused a stir. Wow, he went full. Uh, he went full Roman Catholic priest. Yeah. yeah. I know there, there's a lot of right. memes about it, like uh, between oh, yeah. like him having a fight between the Pope and him over who's the most pet <laughs> religion. <laughs> oh God, it's terrible. Um, mm -hmm. Let's let's avoid those words of YouTube, like ping. I'll probably, oh, I'll probably, I'll probably buzz it sorry. out. Sorry, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'll just buzz it out in the editing. I actually edit my um my uh my. Uh, okay, my sorry. Yep, uh, I I will uh, yeah, watch no worries, my language. No, no, don't worry. I say fuck. I say no. Don't trust me. I I I can't. Well, I mean, yeah, it's a block. By the way, if you want, I just I, I know to avoid certain buzzwords with YouTube. So if you want to talk with uh, Prometheus or us. There will be a moment shortly in a bit. Um, so I think we talked about religion, right? Is there anything else about philosophically about religion you wanted to mention? Hmm. No, I mean, we pretty much covered it. Yeah, I think the next thing we can move to is politics. Um, politics, I guess, like, what are your... Did you want to talk about anything particularly about politics or... Uh, well, I mean, yeah, basically, I'm, I'm a liberal, but... You know, I, I'm kind of more in the moderate Democrat wing now. I mean, I used to be more progressive, but in just over the course of years, you know, where the left is kind of going now is mm, kind of going into the loony bin. So I'm just kind of in the moderate direction. Be happy you don't live in Canada. Mm, yes, I know. Trudeau. I mean, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know this YouTuber named Kevin Castley. I mean, he's a Canadian and he's like uh, kind of a... He calls himself a liberal hawk, but he's, like, pretty conservative. Hmm. I, well, the, the thing is, like, in Canada, like, our our conservative party is, like, a little bit closer to the Democrats in the United States. Like, they're, yeah. they're definitely more conservative than Democrats, but they are uh, kind of more center-right. Like, uh, the conservative party in the United States, um, mm -hmm. the, the policies they put forward, it's, like, judging by there's no universal health care, <clears throat> health care, um, and judging by the fact that there are polls showing that there's actually a lot of Republicans who do support universal health care. Like, what happens when the Republicans get into power, it's really questionable how much they really represent their voting base. And you mm -hmm. can say the same thing about the, 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 a lot of the progressives. And when I, I use progressives Impressive, broadly. Anyway. So when I say progressives, I'm saying anyone left of center, no different than conservative. I don't give a, I don't give a flying F what people say. Um, yeah. There are things that are culturally progressive that aren't regressive. Um, when we're talking about like people are more progressive leaning, and I think culturally I'm progressive leaning on most things. Um, what was it? Uh, like, yeah, there's um, it's 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 also questionable how much people in the United States, like how much do the Democrats really represent the people? Like when it comes yeah. to like when it comes to Justin Trudeau, I think like uh, Springy in here is like very left, very far left. Uh, he hates Trudeau, and it's for reasonable reasons. His his obstructions to freedom of speech, um, and, you know, we, we often talk about it, and we kind of laugh that it's it's pretty funny how many people in Canada, Canada actually support him without any real good reason to support him. And the unfortunate reality is because the mainstream media is quite well paid by the by the our political establishment. It basically, it basically, um, pump, it basically sort of favors him politically in the news articles. Uh, one of the problems is actually, um, like, one of the pro like he actually one time went up on a speech and he literally said this. Uh, I think it was with, like the the journalist union or something. I can't remember what, what, which speech where, where he was giving the speech for, but like I could be wrong. But he actually said uh, a lot of the conservatives claim that. The liberals let the hook let the uh, the mainstream media let the liberals off the hook with no good reason, and he said I gave them he frankly he finds that insulting. He gave them a perfectly good reason. I gave them six hundred million dollars, and like the audience awed and shocked that he said that. Like he basically like he, he's he's joking, that he basically bribed the media and he 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 he's created a sense of favoritism. 
You sometimes hear about liberal bias in the media these days, how they're constantly letting off our government, letting our government off the hook for no good reason. Frankly, I think that's insulting. It's clear that they let us off the hook for a very good reason, because we paid them $600 million. You don't get stellar headlines like these without greasing the wheels a bit. And a conflict of interest. He's kind of bragging about it in the speech. Like, it's, it's, it's really disturbing, um, his history. But yeah, I mean, like, I think the, the problem, like, I think a large problem with the problem of the left is, uh, I think there's, like, a large detachment from working class issues. And a lot of them have been focusing on inter feminist, intersectional, and critical race, uh, race, critical race theory frameworks to frame their perspective of uh class struggles and in doing so they're not really capturing the votes of unions or working class people i really don't mm -hmm. feel like i really don't feel like the left represents us uh i really sometimes feel like they're they're very detached from the working class at times and the, the right is as well but i think the right is able to speak to them a little bit better in recent years because of all this you know I mean? Yeah, I mean, the situation's kind of the same here in America. Like, uh, I mean, you asked, like, you wondered how we, like, we don't have single-payer health care or, like, any universal health care at all. And that's mainly because uh, the medical lobby in our country is the largest lobby, it, even greater than the military. So, and they want a system that, that where they can always make a profit. They don't, and they think that uh, uh, a single-payer system or any form of public health care uh, is a uh, is going to cost them profits. I mean, maybe it will, maybe it won't, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much where that comes from. And like when you talk about like Trudeau, it's the same thing kind of here with Biden and the Democrats. Uh, the The Democrats are kind of more catering to the, the sort of online leftist movement than they are actually talking to uh, Democratic voters and their issues. And mainly the only reason that the Democrats uh, vote with uh, Biden and the Democrats is because they're afraid of the other side. Since Trump has taken over the party, everyone's gone uh, gone pretty nuts. They're like so fearful that Trump or a Trump-like person could end up taking power and pretty much do what they did to uh, Roe v. Wade and just completely overturn it after 49 years of precedent. So well, what that's kind of where it all... It all comes. It's now we're now voting more based on fear than actually who is better on the issues. But what's Roe v. Wade again? Uh, I'm sorry, Roe v. Wade is uh, the uh, abortion, um, the, the abortion case that happened in the 70s. It, it was, it was, uh, it was vo well voted on with the Supreme Court at the time that it would protect uh, abortion access in all 50 states, but. After uh, last year, when the, the the ruling was overturned after like fifty, nearly fifty years of GOP lobbying and trying to get conservative justice on the court to do it, they finally got it. But now it's looking like the it's now waking up some liberal voters more out of fear because they're fearful of losing more of their rights over the course of the following years. Well, oh, um, where are, where are you on pro-choice? Uh, where am pro I? Like pro-choice, uh, pro pro-life. Oh, I'm definitely pro-choice. I mean, I, I, I get the pro-life mo movement. I mean, I can respect their position, but there's people like Matt Walsh or uh, uh, Michael Knowles that really take the position to an extreme extreme place. Like you should be able to carry the term the, the child to term, even if you were raped or had in, or it was forced incest. Yeah. So, and and there were even life even life of the mother was no exception. So so. Okay, so like um, might if I were like run NTT on abortion on you? So like basically, like what is the trait that um like can you name the trait that would basically grant this uh this 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 fetus um. Like what grants a person? Like what, what? What? Sorry, uh, I'm not really oh, all here today. What, 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 uh, what's the point of viability? No, 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 no. Like, can you name the trait? Like, what trait does? Um, what trait would it require to justify? Um, 
killing a human being just like a fetus like what is a trait difference like what traits do you value um well when it comes to I mean, abortion let, let me i mean for me personally i would probably i would definitely be amenable to some sort of restrictions when it comes to uh you know a certain point of viability i'd say when the the fetus develops a central nervous system that's when they'll of course feel pain okay so probably better to not do it after that point unless we're talking about uh life of the mother yeah okay so i, I pretty much kind of um yeah I pretty much align with what you're saying so like ultimately i value this i, I value things like the ability to suffer and feel pain or have an episodic mm -hmm. memory like once this being is able to remember and have a memory or they can feel pain at that point uh it reaches it reaches the threshold of personhood where in my opinion it, it's unjustified to harm this being um but with that being said um like when it comes down to it like uh yeah so like yeah, name the traits pretty popular with uh with like uh vegan debates, but it's also very popular in abortion debates. Um yeah. So, yeah, no, I'm just curious as to what traits you value. Oh yeah, cuz there's definitely a lot of uh, overlap when it comes to uh like the pro-life position and vegan positions. Yeah, and pers well, actually no, even pro-choice like uh like you like technically we could value someone's ability to suffer and then say, "Okay, well, I'm not going to eat animals." Or some jazz like that, you know? Like technically someone could, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. which is actually kind of ironic um so, like technically if most people are pro-life like for all the same arguments if they were to claim like the traits that that give this like the the potentiality to feel the potentiality to live that you don't have the right to take away someone's life if someone that you don't have the right to take away potential for someone's life potentiality to live uh you don't have the right to cause something that could suffer or has memory like if they were to state any of these things like technically, like a lot of these pro-lifers shouldn't be they should they should they shouldn't be at eating animals, which is actually quite funny when you think about it. Um, mm -hmm. Like most progressives, because like there's other traits you can value that would make it consistent. Like you could say that uh, the body, the the original host's body, has the right to do um, whatever they want with it. So like if I had a parasite infect me, and if that parasite was sentient, I should have the right to kill it. Because it, this is my original body. Um, mm -hmm. So someone could use that trait. I I, may, I probably didn't articulate properly. Um, well, but yeah. like So there's different traits you can give to remain consistent with, uh, with uh, being pro-choice. Um, and it's really, like, it, it's an interesting debate subject. Yeah, I mean, like, because, uh, like, I had a, a martial arts... Uh martial arts instructor who was definitely vegan and he kind of got me into veganism for a little bit and you know he basically uh he mentioned like the only the only reasons to to ever harm an animal is if it's to save a life i mean if like in case like you've mentioned a parasite if the parasite is attacking you from the inside that's it is violating your life so in to protect yourself you should you can uh, kill it. And if uh, a coyote is about to attack your infant son, then that's another example of where uh, harming an animal may have to may be uh, permitted. Um, you know? So before we uh, ramble on about that, is there anything else about like politics you want to talk about? UBI, um, ethical, like any of your ethical positions well, on I politics? Mean, poor, poor well, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I would definitely say I'm I'm very pro UBI. I I used to be against it because I thought it was like an extreme form of socialism, but then actually looking into the policy and I realized that you know, kind of the position of UBI, what it could be interpreted from a conservative angle as reducing the overall welfare state. Yeah, that's which, how I see it. Mm hmm. I mean, you can if you can reduce the welfare state while ensuring uh, a better outcome for your citizens, then I say do it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's the way I say, oh, there you go. OK, now I noticed uh, someone was asking uh, someone uh, had a quote. They wanted me to discuss something. You mean uh, I think it was college? paradigm. Actually, I think we're getting close to the end of like everything I want to talk about here with politics. Um... You want to maybe just talk a little bit more about like do you have any other thoughts about politics that we could just bring paradigm on 
what, what what's up? Well, you kind of cut out for a little bit. Oh, like I'm saying, is there anything else you want to talk about politics? Then we could just bring Paradigm on here, and you can have a chat. With oh, them. yeah, you can bring him on. Uh, sure. Paradigm, put up your hand. Put up your hand, Paradigm. Ah, there we go. Okay, there we go. So let's. You might speak. Invite. So yeah, I sent an invite. So I think we're pretty uh, much here. here. Is. If there's anything else you want to say about politics, feel free to say it. Um, hey, Paradigm, you oh, there? We're, we're good. I mean... Yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, so what do you want to say? Oh, uh, I was just saying that I think uh, a discussion between Prometheus and Dr. Avi regarding abortion would be pretty interesting. It sounds like you have a pretty similar position to Avi, but it sounds like your position is more in alignment with uh, pro-life than it would be pro-choice. Um, if you're placing value on the, the sentience of the, the fetus, because, uh, well, obvious position is that we have reason to believe uh, that exercising the precautionary principle would be, um, would be, um, what was the word for it? Um, would be um, sufficient, I suppose. Um, uh, given certain, uh, stages in the process. And so, uh, to put that in more simple terms, basically, um, because of the lack of time that it takes for the precautionary principle, uh, to have strong reasons to exercise it, obvious position is that like most abortions would be, uh, unethical. And it sounds like you might agree with that position, but I'd like to see you two hash it out. Oh, well, yeah, maybe, maybe sometime. Yeah. If you, if it can be arranged, I'll, I'll make that discussion, but basically to uh, answer your question about like, uh, or basically to answer what you said, I mean, I, I said earlier that I do respect the position of pro-life. I mean, I can understand where they're coming from, which is kind of why I put the, uh, the point of viability on basically where the uh, central nervous system is developed because at, at that point there is pain involved. So, but the overall majority of abortions are done well before that point, it's usually done within, uh, I would say between eight and maybe 15 weeks. That would probably be the average range that an abortion occurs. So if we're talking, we're only talking about like a very rare amount of abortions that happen late term, and it's even rarer for like say the the scenario that uh, a child would survive an abortion or the uh, the fetus would survive the abortion hey, um, so, hold on prometheus uh if you want to read down it might take me a while to upload this but when when i do feel free to re-download it and upload it to your channel and i'll i'm going to link both of these guys uh youtube channel in the description but yeah you can continue okay. what you're saying per paradigm paradigm has a chat youtube channel himself but yeah uh, continue paradigm okay um, yeah, what was I about to say? Um, uh, one sec. Let me regather my thoughts. <laughs> not there, no, not... Oh, you're fine. No worries. It's also just a little bit, uh, late at night, so. Oh, I know the <laughs> feeling. Mm. Yo, Prometheus, well, he's, uh, Oh, yeah, so. Oh, here you go. Oh, he remembered it. He remembered it. Go. I was gonna... Yeah, I was gonna ask, uh, just to be clear. You're not placing value on like the sentience of the being in question, but specifically certain properties of that sentience, such as, um, you know, feeling pain or whatnot. Yeah, I, I would consider it. Uh, I would definitely consider it uh, something that would affect my my thinking on the issue. Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I don't I didn't uh, appreciate the answer to the question. Like I was asking. Uh, you, do you not place the value on sentience itself, but rather the properties of like that sentience or specific properties of that sentience, specifically like uh, you were mentioning feeling pain? Yeah, like I, I like I would definitely say that uh, the pr it, the properties of sentience are probably what will affect my judgment on the issue. You know, like, first of all, a person feeling pain that does because I, of course, as all human beings, we do feel pain. So, and I would not wish anything like that on anyone else. 
So it just seems like, you know, putting pain as the threshold for what I would consider some form of sentience to be, mm, that, that would be kind of my m- position. Interesting. Okay. I think a lot of people would probably disagree with that because I think a lot of people place value on the subjective experience itself, even if it was like, for example, like sans uh, pain, right? Um, and so I think that um, it, I mean, I guess it just depends on who you're talking to, but I feel like that, um, at least in the circles I'm in, a lot of the time, it seems like most people, um, they're placing value on like sentience. And so I, I would think that that might be something that gets disputed, but maybe I'm mistaken too. Actually, paradigm. Well, I mean, you'd have to you'd have to define at what point uh, sentience occurs, which is actually to... why I was really interested in you having that conversation with Avi because Avi uh, gets into that with uh, empirics and he's really good at it and he uh, his position is pretty strong. I think uh, he presents it best though. I can't really present it very well um, compared to him, actually, but think... um... actually, mind if I chime in real quick, paradigm? Oh, go, yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, so, like, mind if I give you, like, an example? Like, for example, like, for me, I do value sentience, but for me, sentience alone is... I do value properties of sentience. But, like, for example, like, if a fetus... Like, for example, if a human couldn't feel pain, but if they had all the memories and experiences that a human has, like, does that mean that I should value that human less? Like, and do you... Well, you're... you're, you're, Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, so, like, um, this is kind of, like, why I value memory alongside, like... To, to to an extent like similarly to that to feel pain and suffer is because um the ability to have memories in and of itself is a um it's a chronological state of being able to develop an ego and being able to take away something's memories and the things that it remembered and experienced is uh terrible in my opinion. um <clears throat> So like well, that's actually, like yeah cool. so yeah uh anyways yeah oh, you I'm go. sorry go, you go. Go. no you keep, like finish your thought well I mean like yeah there's other things like you know ability to feel motion like technically I could have a human being who forgets everything they remember every five seconds but they or like every maybe like they forget a lot of things every thirty seconds but they feel a lot of emotions and they can suffer what if they don't suffer what if they don't remember but they feel a lot of emotions so there's different things that we value but like I think that there should be something other than just I think I think like maybe it's a stronger position to value like memory and the ability to suffer. Yeah. So I mean I, I would ask uh, I w- or I would make a, a point to say like you know when when it comes to uh, like memory for example I mean it is the pain that will determine whether that memory is negative. I mean if you if you can't feel pain then how can you understand whether something is positive or negative? Well, you can technically feel emotional pain. You can feel comfort, but you might not feel physical pain. Oh, like, yeah, but we're, we're talking about a, feel, with a fetus. Yeah. So, I mean, I... I... So, you know, yeah, so oh. basically for a fetus, um, yeah, I mean, like, the, the... I guess, like, the obvious reductives I could have to that is, like, um, technically, like, if... So if other beings existed, whether it's be mentally disabled people or other people that have... Ex- or other animals that existed... If they had lots of memories, but they didn't really have the ability to feel pain, like, should we not value them, like, physical pain? Like, in other words, I'm saying, like, the development of the brain, like, the development of the brain and its ability to remember shouldn't necessarily, like, its only value shouldn't necessarily be its ability to feel, uh, to suffer. I'm saying there's other things we value, like, the, the actual experience of, uh... The actual experience of having memories and things that you can, um, and experiences that you can remember. I don't know, to me, it's something terrifying to take away someone else's, to take away anything else's memories. Okay. I mean, like, because what, like, what I would put as an example, like, for my, for my point is, like, if you throw, like, a small rock, like, at a, at a rhinoceros, I mean, chances are that rock is just going to bounce off the rhinoceros' skin and it's not going to feel anything. So there's no... I, from a rhinoceros' perspective, there is going to be no negative memory if he never felt the action committed. But if you throw a small rock and hit a human, of course it's going to feel pain, so they're going to remember it as a more negative experience. Mm. Okay, so like if there was a human that didn't have the ability to feel pain, but they had a memory, like should that person be morally considered? Like they couldn't feel physical pain. 
Hmm. Like, like I'd say, say, I mean, we're using now like a fictional example, like Superman. I mean, Superman is invulnerable, oh. and he's not going to. He, so he can feel he can't feel pain though. Like I'm, well, he can feel pain, but it takes a lot of force generated. Yeah. I mean, he's not going to feel pain if he gets hit by a bus. So, but when you when you know that that he's invulnerable, you you feel less of that internal connection with him, as yeah. if it was like say Lois Lane getting hit by a bus, because then you'd feel the pain. You you'd psychologically project the pain. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, but so I'm saying like, so would you feel much moral consideration towards Superman? Let's just say like in a hypothetical Superman didn't feel any pain whatsoever physically. Like, is he not worth moral consideration because he can't feel pain, physical pain? I mean, I would probably, I would never wish actual pain on him. I would never wish for kryptonite to be in his presence. I mean, that would definitely, I mean, all other than that, I mean, you know, there is... I mean, if if it's he's going to be hit with something that he's really not going to feel or it's not going to bother him, then there is some moral consideration in that. Well, no, he would be able to feel emotionally, just not. I said physical pain. So he could feel emotional discomfort. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, emotional pain, de definitely. I mean, emotional pain. Yeah, there's still. Uh, you can still could empathize mm -hmm. because I mean he's not emotionally vul invulnerable. Yeah. But I mean, I was I was talking about the physical plane. Yeah, I know. Um, but I'm saying like about this person. My point is like this person dying, like this person having moral consideration. Uh, like, should we give moral consideration to people if they can't feel physical pain? That's really what I'm getting at here. Okay. Yeah, and I'm and I'm trying to think. You know, is if. If you're aware that they can't feel pain and they're and they know you know that they're they're not going to feel uh that they're not going to feel a physical they're not going to feel physical injury they're not going to feel pain so therefore they're not going to take it as more as a negative experience then you do kind of take away from that that maybe it's there is a little more or or a little more a little less moral consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like I think that's like. My issue with it is, like, even if they can't feel physical pain, they still can feel uh, a spectrum of emotional intuitions. And Yeah, the, and that, and and being that to, I can agree with. So there I, there I definitely still have empathy with, like, emotional, definitely emotional pain. But when it comes to, like, uh, if you know for a fact that something is not going to harm them physically, then it's hard to take that uh, moral consideration. So it sounds like to me... You do value, um, you do value uh, the ability to feel pain, but you also value the ability to feel uh, emotions. So, like when it comes, to I mean, emotions can be pain as well. So, so basically, uh, what you're getting at here, so like for example, if a fetus could feel emotional intuitions, but they couldn't feel physical pain, like in a hypothetical, like at that point, it, does that fetus get moral consideration? I'm curious. Now. I mean, if if that if I definitely saw some studies that can prove that there was a negative experience, like in that universe, they had a negative, like in negative universe. thought. Like, you know what? If they if again they can't if they can't feel physical pain, then I just do not see a a, con, a correlation with emotional pain if they can't if they're not uh, viable enough to understand the difference between like the emotional pain and the uh, like physical pain. Yeah. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, kind of, but, like, I'm just saying, like, in a hypothetical, like, so we're, we're, like, so Prometheus, like, this is kind of, like, we're normative, this is, like, a complete normative discussion for ethics, so, like, uh, we're just kind of, like, giving our positions and our preferences on these things, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so, like, basically, I'm gonna try to say, like, so, like, in Universe B, let's just say babies felt emotional intuitions, uh, two weeks before they could feel pain, so they could start feeling emotions like comfort, discomfort, fear, anger, like, so they started to be able to develop some level of emotional intuition, like, very mm -hmm. primitive emotional intuition, two weeks before they could feel pain. Like, would it be immoral to kill them after a week of development, emotional development? Like, they could feel fear and discomfort, but they didn't feel physical pain. Like, would it be okay to kill that fetus? Hmm. I mean, I mean, I'll admit, that's a good question. 
I mean, if they are in, if, if the physical pain they feel like, cause like I said, the physical pain that they feel is what would drive the emotional, uh, the emotional, uh, anxiety as let, let's put it that way. The, the negative emotional feelings would be invoked due to the actual pain. So if there is no pain, then I would have to see that there is emotional, like well, some emotional distress before I would even take a consideration. I think like a being could feel like, so in a hypothetical, like a being, like, like there could be a different emo, there could be a different physical sensation that is not pain that causes something. So, like, I could have a physical sensation telling me that this isn't right that doesn't create a physical sensation of suffering. It just tells me physically something's not right, and then I feel fear. Yeah, and, so and it's I no, have to it's ask. No different, it's no different than if I, like, had this feeling I'm being followed. I look behind me, somebody's following me, and I have this gut intuition that something's not okay. Or, like, I'm laying down in a weird way, and I just feel like something's not right maybe my posture is bad like i'm saying if 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 if, if, um, if fetuses could actually sense when thing when they were when they're at a physical risk of harm before they could feel physical pain so if they could be aware of um if they had some level of awareness of what was in their best interest physically and when they're outside of that physical awareness of their best interest if they could feel fear like would it be okay to uh, would it be okay to kill the fetus? Yeah, I mean, definitely. This is where, like, when my I when I say I respect the pro life argument, this is kind of the the basis for where I would respect it. However, I gotta also remember that there is the mother, the the, is, the mother's situation. Yeah, but this is just a hypothetical. Even oh, I know. This is I know this is just a hypothetical. So I mean, like I said, there 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 would be definite arguments that could uh, sway me in one direction or another. But like I said, I am pro-choice because now going back to uh, like reality, I do believe that a wo a woman does it. The baby is within a woman until a certain point of viability, where I would say the central nervous system, but other. Other than that, I would definitely see like that whole period as it being the mother's choice. Mm. That because the mother is the one that's going to have to suffer through the pregnancy. But to get back to your hypothetical, I mean, I admit that would definitely raise some questions, and I maybe have to reflect on that a little more. But uh, yeah. overall, I mean. I would believe that it is more likely to invoke a certain type of empathy for physical pain rather than the emotional pain of a fetus, because basically I'm weighing it against the feelings of the mother. Yeah, I think I think like I um I think like I said before, like I think these types of discussions are like uh in a weird I mean, they're, they're good they're, they're good discussions. Yeah. I mean I, I like being pushed on my beliefs it kind of gives me clarity to uh m my overall positions yeah and I, I like being able to do this with people in a really calm civil manner but like um remember when i said like yeah, I think... I, I, I mean... oh you go oh go ahead remember when i said like this the the level of civil discourse has been uh i think increasing on the internet the level of like uh the um mm -hmm. the intellectual um the intellectual threshold to be taken seriously um when it comes to like discourse and i think these types of conversations help raise the bar um being challenged on issues it's uh but yeah like you yeah. don't have to have an answer and this is a hypothetical and to the audience oh yeah i know i well, hold on i, I mean it, it, it's good to actually get this uh to get these kind of hypotheticals out of the way because they I mean these things could very well be i mean because like i said i don't know anything about like when a fetus would develop consciousness uh, but I do know, like, I, I think at the, the 20 week mark is when they develop uh, or have a fully developed central nervous system. So that's when the, the fetus would feel pain. Yeah. So that's kind of where I take my original basis. But again, I am not familiar of fetal consciousness. So yeah. I'd have to look at any information that talks about that and maybe I'd have to reflect on it. But overall, my position is more towards like the choice of the mother 
But I think if you've had like, say, 20 weeks of this pregnancy and you still haven't made up your mind, well, I mean, come on, you got to you should have at least made up your mind on whether you're going gonna see this through to the end or not. Yeah. Um... Yeah. And if you are interested in having that discussion about um, about fetal consciousness and looking at the data behind it and whatnot and uh, and the logical structure of the position. Um, I could definitely um, ping Avi for you or like show you where you could ping him. You could uh, get a hold of him on Twitter or just hop into his Discord server and ping him. And uh, he's very good faith and he'd uh, he'd totally be willing to have a conversation with you once he's available. He might you might have to set it up uh, in advance in case he's not available at the time. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll I'd probably definitely like to let, like see any material that he has that I so I can definitely like uh, take a look at it for myself. But yeah, yeah he'll be I mean, if, I, if, I, if I get the opportunity to talk to him, I'll probably do it, take it. Yeah, um, he's 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 a very open guy. Uh, definitely willing to uh, you know, flesh out his position with other people and share the the information that he's come across. So um, I think it would be a very fruitful and um, you know, uh, a a good conversation to help you kind of get a more clear view on maybe what the more sentient position a uh, sentientist position would be um but yeah um so um do you want me to just like put in the chat like his twitter or something or his discord server so you can go there or um yeah well just just give me his twitter handle and i'll i'll take it from there okay no problem one sec yeah he's more active on twitter um yeah prometheus um before we actually, I did really want to push on this. Like, when it comes to UBI, um, like, like, mind if I turn the page to UBI for a sec? No, oh, go go for it. Like uh, overall, like, um, do you think we're at a point where like we're ready for UBI financially? Because like when it comes to like a living standard UBI, that's something I might disagree with with Andrew Yang. I, I'm not. I don't think we're quite there financially yet. But I think, like, a lot of the First World Nations are getting close. Uh, no, I, honestly, I mean, I think we were ready in the 1960s. I mean, I, I know that's a little bit uh, overly optimistic. But, I mean, I can, I definitely think that, yeah, we, we were ready for it then. Because you need to have it uh, Im, uh, imbued in the citizenry for quite a, a period of time before, you know, because you have to... Uh, you have to you have to care for the adjustment period because well, it is going to be a relative change. I think I meant living standard UBI. Like technically, we could have had in the sixties like ten twenty dollars given to you a month by the government. So when I mean living standard, I mean like a thousand, thousand five hundred, two thousand dollars a month, like minimum eight hundred. You, you could probably pull pull a thousand because a thousand's like low enough to where it doesn't affect the labor pool. Or it doesn't like art, like create an artificial, uh, or it doesn't create problems for the labor pool. That mm -hmm. that's well, yeah. Like I think a, a large argument I hear is like people do think it would create a problem for the labor pool, including myself. But like I think a lot of the problems it creates would also be justified to an extent. If people would go back to school, invest in their businesses. Um. Oh God, I'm not. I'm not letting. I'm not letting Frank on here. You don't know him like I do. Jesus. Not during a podcast. Yo, what's up, Frank? My homie. My nigga, how you doing? Yeah, Fra Fra Frank, though, Frank's a little trolly. Um, history strong is shorter. He's a good friend of mine. So if you do come in here, Frank, like, you can't troll and shit. I'm recording. I'm creating content. Um, so yeah, Prometheus, like, when it comes to, like, universal basic income, uh, like, I guess, like, would you like what was it when it comes to like the labor market shifting like i don't even see how that's a bad thing like couldn't we just bring in immigrants to do more jobs if we had the money for ubi well because what's what's ha what's happening with the labor market now is it's going to be shifting to more automation and i mean we're talking about uh machines that are going to be uh picking the fruits machines that are going to be cleaning uh even machines that are going to be doing landscaping. And I mean, I, I don't mean to stereotype, but uh, basically a lot of the jobs that immigrants are coming into this country to get from uh, Americans that really don't want to do these jobs, I mean, that's all going to be replaced by machines. So immigration is probably going to be seriously affected as well. 
Well, yeah, but for the low skill jobs that have yet to be automated, I'm just saying. Yeah, like, the low I'm, the low skill jobs are definitely no, going to be uh, hold up, hold automated. Up. Yeah, but I'm saying low skill jobs that have yet to be automated. I'm saying like uh, the things that we need in our economy. Like I'm just saying, like I because I, I, I often hear like critics of UBI say like, oh well, you know, um, you'll often hear critics claim that people will not be likely to participate within an economy. Um, my criticism, counter criticism to that is, if you have the money for that, you could also just bring in more immigrants for any particular field that you need. So, like, if you need nurses, this, that, the third, you could just bring in new people. Um, I don't really see what the problem is per se. Yeah, uh, but like, mean, it, again, it's it's all about like the, the type of jobs that AB uh, that uh, AI is going to be taking away. I mean, we we still need to know the full extent of it before yeah. we can uh, we can talk about immigration. I think like there's a possibility you like we might not new jobs might come into play that have yet to be foreseen. Yeah. Have you heard that argument before? Um. Well, yes. When it comes to when it comes to AI, there is going to be new new jobs for humans, to, human beings to do, because old jobs are going to disappear. So new jobs are going to have to be created. It's just how uh, the economy is going to be terraformed for the future. Yeah. So um, I think when it comes down to it all, like I'm basically what I'm saying is there's one possibility in the future where there, even with AI, there will be new jobs for everyone to for everyone that have yet to be foreseen, and there's possibility. B, where like uh, AI essentially takes a lot of the jobs or the or all the jobs eventually. Um, yeah, but I think what where they're coming from, it, I mean, because there's going to be like a point where it's like if you're like in your 50s and you've been like, say, a trucker for like 30 years of your life, you know, it's going to be diff it's going to be difficult for you to find a new job because your job has now been uh, automated. So you're you're going to have a much harder time adjusting to the new economy than say someone from Gen Z who is definitely more likely to be uh tech savvy and actually um they and apparently according to what I'm reading they actually are more not socially isolated but I think they they they're more solitary in how they do their work I mean do you understand what I'm saying mm. uh yeah uh kind of they're more, like they're, 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 more like. they're more oriented towards cyber jobs. Yeah, okay. Which um, are likely to be more as long as you give them a closet, you know, if as they can probably live in a closet because they they'll they'll have all they need just to do a job. Yeah. I think when it comes down to like the subject of like uh, when it comes down to the subject of like automation, I think over time mm -hmm. all the jobs will eventually be replaced. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm saying one or two oh. possibilities. The possibility all jobs will be replaced. Or possibility they like there will be a shift and there'll be tons of new jobs for new people to have. I don't think that's the case. And like I I, I, I think I call it, yeah I, think I call it the fallacy of the past. Like just because something's happened in the past doesn't mean it'll happen in the present. Like uh, for example, like when it comes to automation, we have to look at how automation's happened. We've automated transportation. We've automated uh, what was it uh, manufacturing and uh what was it, agriculture but once we automate mm -hmm. service away then what is there yeah, left because the when, when we automate when we automate agriculture and all those things what we did is we sped up service and transportation when we get rid of transportation all will be left is service and once we get left of service there is no there's no level of speeding up different jobs they're just all going to be gone and I, that's what i personally think is going to happen like Actually, I knew somebody who was working on AI and the A like there's literally there's an AI program that is being programmed to make other programs to replace developers. So developers are making a AI to automate their own job. Self-replicating AI. I, yeah. I'm yeah, it's, cra it. it's crazy. Um, but yeah, it's like, how do I it's like I, I try to explain this to people, but how do you how do you argue to somebody that they should wake up that automation isn't just it's not just um, this wave of AI will be different in the coming future? I mean, ChatGPT should be the wake up call to everyone. ChatGPT, who's that? ChatGPT, it's uh, that new thing from OpenAI that uh, you you basically it's it's like a 
it's like a search engine, although it's it's like much more advanced. Like right now, I'm using it. I'm using it to write code myself. So like like actual yeah. computer code. I mean, I know how to read Python, the, the computer code, but I use I just type in ChatGPT. Like, hey, can you write me a code for say uh, like a music player? And it'll give me the Python code for me to uh, copy and put into uh, what I call PyCharm, and then it'll make me a program. So basically, like it'll and it also like it'll it'll answer questions with uh, very with much clarity. I mean, if you ever go, if you ever find out, go to OpenAI.com, and then create a profile, and then uh, set, click Try ChatGPT, and then ask it any question you want. I mean, any question, and it'll give you a very concise answer that's like uh, almost like a human being could could have typed it up. Mm. Yeah, dude, ChatGPT is awesome. I use it to debug my code all the time, and, like, I'm always impressed by the answers it gives, like, 9 out of 10 times. Like, it's it's definitely, like, revolutionary. Yeah, and, and the new ChatGPT that's out uh, now, ChatGPT4, I mean, although they haven't released the full features of it yet, but they're now, they're now managing to be able to uh, completely write code for games. Like, you can literally create the, the, the Snake game. Like, Within, in an instant, the same code. And there's also a new uh, feature that they, you could take a picture of a, of a sketch or like of writing on a, say, on a napkin and then say, create a website out of this. And it'll literally create a website for you based on everything you sketched on that napkin. Jesus. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, yeah, you could just if you need to take some time, just take a look at YouTube, uh, look up YouTube and like chat GPT four and what it it's capable of. And you will you will be floored about what this thing is can do. Oh, geez. Prometheus, you're, you're oh, yeah, that's super impressive, man. You're you're, you're, you're I, I don't know if I should be hopeful or be having a panic attack. You're, oh, you're, yeah, I mean, you're setting off the, <laughs> you're setting off the automation alarmist in me. Oh yeah, I mean, trust me. It it when the moment this thing happened, the the, the first time this thing came out, uh, there was there was an epidemic of uh, professors like realizing that their students were using ChatGPT to write their history their, their papers. Like they could write a whole thesis, uh, just from ChatGPT alone and copy and paste it, and they could get a good grade from their professor on it. So when they found out about it. They had to completely change how they teach and what kind of assignments they do. They're probably going to be requiring more in-class participation work now. Yeah, what was it? Um, I think like, uh, yeah, I think something you mentioned on earlier is um, the normalization. Like, if there's something I agree with you, as I think UBI should have been normalized into our culture and society. Like, whether this yeah. was giving someone a dollar a month or whether this was giving someone five dollars a month. It would yeah, be nice. Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman originally came up with a negative income tax, which is it's not UBI, but it's pretty close. I mean, so if this thing could have been, if this thing could have happened in nineteen, and I believe in nineteen seventy two, it, it was it was close to passing, but the Democrats didn't vote for it. So what was so, a negative income tax? Uh, a negative income tax. I mean, I, it's a little hard to explain. I mean, I'm a uh basically it's like when you file something on your taxes and you make like turns out you make less income than like say the average or something like that they'll the government will pay you back the difference so i mean i'm probably not doing it justice right now but, that, but that's what i took from it it's that's like the concept. when you're it's like what milton friedman said about it is you know like the poor the the, the poor need they need money. I mean, the poor need money, but you, they, they don't want uh, programs that uh, cost more money to regulate than just giving the money out in general. Yeah. Which that was the, uh, the precedent for the negative income tax for saying, you know what, this is a cheaper, it's a cheaper and more efficient way to make sure that people are less poor in the country. I mean, it's best to just give them cash without uh, any money going towards oversight. Because it's the people, how they want to spend their money is their business. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. So like I said, you probably want to look up the negative income tax too. Make sure that you, you probably get it from him. It's the, uh, from what Milton Friedman said. It's probably better to do it that way because I am definitely not doing it justice. I'll put it in the description down below, but I think like overall, um, when it comes down to it, I think it would be nice if it was normalized into our society. Like Alaska gives out a small amount, like $100, $200 a yeah, month. That, that's, an, that's, another, that's another form. Uh, there's also someone you can definitely follow on, uh, on Twitter. He's like a UBI guru. He was, uh, Andrew Yang's, uh, advisor on the issue. His name is, uh, Scott Santens. I mean, let me see if I can find it in chat or let me see if I can, I'm trying to see if I can put a, put it in, uh, yeah, like for me, a big, I'm trying to see if I can find a chat to put it into, but okay, maybe this is, yeah, you, show, UBI is one of those. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, uh, let me let me just type his name. Yeah, UBI is one of those things I kept telling myself, oh, I'm going to read it. But, like, every time I do a video, I just always end up doing research. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I, I spend a lot of my time reading other subjects. But, yeah, UBI is one of those things I probably should read more about. Since I actually I do think it is probably the most logical solution. Yeah, I mean, guys. if you want to read some, uh, his work... He's been, a, I think, a UBI activist since like 2013, and he practically is an expert on the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just gonna put in his name and his qualifications. I, I forgot his Twitter handle. I'm thinking it's Scott Santens. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it? Um, your paradigm. Do you have any opinions on UBI? My unofficial co-host at this that? point. My my what unofficial my unofficial co-host, Paradigm. Do you have any opinions on UBI? What's what's UBI? Universal basic income. So basically, government gives out free money, and it potentially, depending on who you ask, it could be either for a living standards so like one thousand dollars, or it could be less than that. It could be like. 200 500 300 dollars just enough to afford groceries um but the overall concept would be to try and enrich people's lives financially rather than than rather by giving them direct money rather than actually trying to create new programs for them to use mm -hmm. in an economy yeah basically uh with with uh, what conservatives would say about ubi is that you can uh, instead of just putting through them through like all these programs that you know uh cash programs that require oversight they cost more money because you're paying for the oversight as well as paying for the money that goes directly to the citizen instead why don't you just pay for the money to go to the citizen every every month and basically what you're arguing for is that the cit the private citizen is going to get the money rather than have that money sit in a government coffer whereas liberals would or left wingers would say look you're just you're giving money to the people to help fight poverty. Yeah, true. I mean, I don't have any strong opinions on it, but I can definitely see how that could potentially uh, lead to a more robust economy and uh, potentially lead to uh, higher living standards. <laughs> so basically, like in studies I've done with UBI and experiments, if the government actually financially balances its budget to its expenses, uh, there seems to be minimal inflation, at least from what I said. From what I understand, from just listening to the authorities, I haven't actually done in-depth research about this, or at least not in a long, long time. When balanced, when it's a balanced budget for this program, there isn't uh, an inflationary deficit problem, uh, or at yeah. least not as much. Inflation is usually yeah, it, more minute. If, there's there's inflation, but it's more minute. But when uh, it's not balanced, and it's just government printing money, there is inflation. Well, yeah. if, it, if it's government printing money, then yeah, it's going to cause inflation. But if you're talking about like, uh, like say a value added tax, or uh, there's another character. I mean, he's he's kind of a uh, he's a bit of a fringe character, but I, he's he's also like definitely into like technology, AI, robotics. But he's also for it. He's a libertarian, and he believes in like a like a land dividend where you you lease all the federal land. That the United States has two private corporations. They can build whatever they want. You give them a lease, and then the proceeds from those leases go towards a UBI program for all the citizens. So, wow. or and Andrew Yang believed in a va uh, value added tax, 
which is a com consumption based tax instead of the income tax system that we currently have. That was actually a really good idea, leasing government land to private businesses, and in turn, that money goes yeah. back to assist. That's actually a wonderful. Yeah, the, the guy. Um, let me. I'll put his name. In, I'll put that guy's name in too with the in the chat. I mean, if people want to find find him on Twitter, um, or look up a video of his on YouTube, uh, he's a Hungarian guy, but his name is uh, his name is Zoltan Istvan. Wait, wasn't that? I mean, he, he actually ran in the Republican side during the 2020 election against Trump, but he didn't get anywhere. Hmm. Name rings a bell. What was it? Yeah, um, you, could, you could definitely find him. Yeah, I think that's pretty much all the questions I had for you for tonight. Um... Well, it was, it was wonderful talking to you. Uh, you too, uh, you too, Paradigm. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. It was definitely a good conversation. Prometheus, uh, I'll link your YouTube channel, your Twitter. Is there anything else you want me to link? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, uh, that's pretty much everything. I mean, I do have a Minds, but I'm not active on there anymore. Uh, okay, so you don't want me to link your Minds? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I mean, so it's fine. It would be a waste of time. I probably wouldn't even end up following anybody. All right, so with that being said, um, is there anything that you want to say to me, or... Any questions? No, I just want to. Well, I want to say thank you for having me on. It was a very, very productive conversation. I want to thank your audience for welcoming me into uh, your podcast as well, and I want to thank uh, Paradigm for having the time to come on and join us and ask me some questions. Really challenge my position on uh, abortion and sentience. It was really interesting, and I hope to learn more about it in the uh, future. Okay, so I guess with that being said. Um... To the audience, do everything you can to help the do everything you can to help the channel. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Please help this channel grow. And with that being said, have an amazing twenty four hours. So